kind of extra weird that time for some reason. Something fun. Okay. All right. Here for things sister views were extra weird that time for some reason. Something fun. Okay. All right. Okay, we're going to get started with our afternoon session. Um, but before we do, I just want the jury to reintroduce themselves. Lots of people are coming and going. We have new jury faces and new people uh, with us. So we will start right here with them. Uh, hi, I'm Devin Perkins, and um, I was associate principal at Hickok Hole for 14 years, and I just retired last year. So I have plenty of time to come to these reviews. <laughs> I'm Bill Bonster. I'm a, a 1983 Bjork here uh, in Maryland. I uh, have a 35 person firm with my partner, David Harrison, and some good people. And uh, I've uh, just stepped down as chair of the Board of Visitors here of uh, alumni. And uh, I did uh, so many other things here at Maryland. I have a scholarship, a Terp Star, Star scholarship as well. Nice to be here. Hi everyone, I'm Mika Yamaguchi and I am currently working with ZGF Architects in DC. Hi everyone, I'm Candice Maloney Franklin. I am currently working at To Be Done Studios. Nice to Hi everyone, Dana McKinney, a design critic at the GSD and then also a co-founder of Enfold Collective. Hello everyone, um, Portia Strahan with Palm City Architects and former professor 400-401 um, at University of Maryland a couple years ago. Thanks everyone for being here and we'll turn it over to Ben. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending these thesis project presentations today. To provide some context for this presentation and share my connection with the site at hand, the project I am presenting is an adaptive reuse of a building that once served as my grandfather's law office for nearly 50 years in the neighborhood of Hamden in Baltimore City and is located next to a building that once housed Bernstein Furniture, a furniture store that was started by my grandparents in the great grandparents in the 1930s. The objective of this thesis is to preserve the character of a national, of a national historic district through the creation of a center for preservation craft using a historic Main Street structure. The National Historic Districts have limits as to how much can be protected, largely against government intervention. But due to a lot of like homeowners and residents in a historic district not having any government intervention, they have free reign over the facades of their buildings. So the thesis location I chose to work in is Hamden. And Hamden is a national historic district without local designation. So there are a lot of homeowners who are changing the facades of their houses without recognizing the historic context of their neighborhood. So So Hamden is located in North Baltimore, it is has a main street at its heart right through there. That is the source of social and commercial life. 
it is located along Falls Road here. So Hamden was started as the residential town adjacent to the mill town of Woodbury, which was really like a hot place of industry. So Hamden was home to mostly blue collar workers in the late 19th century and was constructed largely of brick houses and currently retains a large percentage of historic housing stock. So here is an image of one of the mills with Hamden in the background. The West 36th Street developed as the commercial corridor due to its proximity to Falls Road, which was a main thoroughfare of Baltimore City. And it developed as such with a large amount of brick structures surrounding it due to the class of workers in the area living there. One of the features that developed in the mid 20th century was formstone cladding on a lot of the houses due to its giving a stone-like effect on the building stock. So it pro protected some of the more vulnerable brick structures, but also provide a level of distinction among the homogenous brick grow houses. In the late 20th century, there was, sorry about that. <laughs> There's a level of disinvestment, but by the 90s, there started to be a new class of people moving into Hamden with a high amount of young professionals who started to renovate the homes they were moving in. In the book, The Baltimore Row House, Mary Ellen Hayward and Charles Belfort discussed how gentrification could be seen by the removal of formstone on historic housing. So that's one of the issues I want to address. The overall key site project is to create a center for preservation, dealing with issues such as removal of form zone, but also restoring the existing housing stock so, so by the homeowners. So this will be achieved through the creation of three main spaces in the center, a wet restoration space, a dry restoration space and a digital preservation lab. So the site that I chose is at this key intersection of Falls Road and West 36th Street and has existed since the late 18, 1800s with it developing to be its taking up the full lot size in 1901 and then reducing in size later on to be only a portion of the lot size. Here is a perspective of it as it is now. And it is part of the entry condition. So there is a high level of visibility on the Western facade when the commercial avenue is entered. The current structure stands with a storefront with the entry that is a replacement of the original storefront. It was originally a market and grocery, but later developing various pur purposes, jewelry store, law office, TV repair shop, and now a salon. So the existing structure is split with residential space above and commercial space below. The levels are split and disjointed in the current structure. So part of this project addresses the disjointed quality of the building by evening out the existing structural spaces. Here is a view of the rear and the side. Because of this being a program, having the program of a community center of sorts, it will be necessary to expand to occupy, have the building occupy the full lot size. The 
current structure has various historic elements that have been preserved since the early 1900s, such as wallpaper that is below layers of paint, lime mortar, and horsehair plaster, along with original stone foundations buried beneath certain new additions. Looking at the site, I was able to develop a few different schemes that analyze how these new additions can be added on. And the project ended up going in the direction of having a central courtyard to provide light and air into the building. The new construction is built up over the existing structure with additions to the side alleyway and the rear with an increased level in the back, making it go from three stories in the front and two stories in the back to three stories throughout the building. The communal space in the front of the building is divided to allow for a temperance bar, which is a new typology in this neighborhood that allows for socialization and people to enter the building during the throughout the day when classes are not being held in the rear. So it also introduced people to see the activity going on, even if they're not all that interested in preservation. So this modified facade has a sim simplified stepped flat roof with glazing breaking up the new structure from the old and an application of a formstone like material will be applied to kind of provide a new sense of entryway this area will have the a corner condition that is altered to reflect a more commercial nature to the building at the front portion and, and a storefront entrance to provide a higher level of visibility than what is existing. The rear will allow access for larger items to enter the studio spaces in the rear while also allowing for fire egress. And on the roof, there'll be a sol series of solar panels angled to capture the light, and turn it in, into energy, along with an extensive green roof for insulation purposes in the rear. The overall split has the of the building has the working spaces in the rear with a courtyard dividing them from less um, extensive activities. So the computer lab offices and temperance bar at the bottom portion. The, the first floor has the a double entry one side allowing it to enter, have the stairs be, <laughs> to have people enter and go straight up to the second floor and access the digital lab and the dry studio. While on the other side, it's an easier access to the temperance bar and, or to have a straight shot to the rear wet studio. So, this is a view of the temperance bar, which can be reconfigured based on the needs and activities going on. So if there is the need to host a larger event, the bar can be split up and rearranged according to the occurrence. Here's kind of a view of the rear of it before transitioning, which is adjacent to the courtyard. And here's the wet preservation space, restoration space in the rear, which contains modular desk units and storage bookcases that can be ran along a track and be adjusted to the needs of the studio space. 
So the overall space can house like up to 24 people if necessary, but can be reconfigured. So you have a set of six desks that a student can have access to individually. So you have this versatility to how the space is being used. This space largely would be used for teaching about plaster work, repointing masonry, and refinishing work. Mostly minor, like nothing too extensive or hazardous. This is kind of more of a what can the homeowner do with their property without extensive, <laughs> extensive amount of intervention. So now we move on to the second floor where a large, the portion over the temperance bar is occupied by a computer lab and the rear is the other studio. The computer lab is also set up with desks that can be built up and built down depending on the needs of the building. And the dry restoration space is mostly for woodworking, but also can be used for reglazing re windows and working on ornamental details. The setup is similar to the wet restoration space where there's a modular system for desks, but it's limited in having the capacity to only handle a dozen students at once due to the necessary requirements of such activities being held there. And here's another view. There's a mezzanine on the third floor that, re that connects to the administrative offices and allows for administrators to get a broader look onto the activities being held here. And here's the third floor kind of showing how that mezzanine connects to the offices. The offices also have an access to a balcony seen here that looks over the courtyard. So there's this level of being able to monitor the activities being held within the site. And yeah, here's probably hard to see on this monitor. <laughs> Um, but in conclusion, this project aims to, would aim to reshape how per preservation is perceived through its occupancy along the main street. So currently there isn't much of a culture for preservation in this neighborhood. And then by having this be in a central location, it would introduce the subject of preservation to people and hopefully invite them in to see the activities going on. Um, I am looking forward to your questions. Thank you. A little bit about the operation. Uh, oh, do I need that? Hello. Uh, tell us a little bit about the operation. You're, uh, this is a craft studio to expose residents and others to the benefits of preservation? Yes. And they'll be able to come and see these processes happening while you're? Yes, there's the high level of glazing outside the classrooms will allow for a level of passerbys to see the activities going on. There is a high level of, a, there isn't a high level of transparency currents currently in this building and it's important that as a gateway building to the avenue that people can have a welcoming site condition and having preservation be that activity could have a big influence on the neighborhood. Can you walk through the materials on the facade? Yes. So, so the ex I guess this kind of breaks it down where the existing brick wall will have the paint stripped and be repointed while a new surface coating of formstone will be applied. This is kind of going off the notion that 
the removal of formstone is a sign of gentrification. So by having a building that has formstone applied to it, which I do have a drawing here that kind of goes over the technical aspects of what that could look like in a way that doesn't damage the historic fabric. So this is kind of helping to reshape the perspective that people have on formstone as not necessary not necessarily just like an ugly application, but something that has a history to the culture of the neighborhood. So is it like a veneer stone, like just a thin veneer? Yeah, well, it's, or is it like a precast? It's not precast. It would have to be, formstone has historically been sculpted by hand onto the building, onto buildings, and then tinted as an exterior layer. And then sometimes a mica kind of spray is added to it to give it it's like glistening effect so it would have to be it would be a sculpted element then talk about what is the material above the brick oh so a glass curtain wall would kind of frame the historic bricks frame the brick structure so that's all glass yes okay i was having trouble telling whether it was metal panel or glass um, just, you know, interpreting what that materiality was. Okay. So I can start, or you want to start? So thank you for the incredibly detailed drawing, but that's also what's going to get you in trouble. <laughs> just kidding. It's not, not getting you in trouble, but just thing, things that I react to. So so I think the way you've dealt with the formstone here and creating the, this sort of nice corner entrance with this corner opening into the sacred space, I think that's going to be a really nice move for the corner. I appreciate the little extra kind of detail that happens on this end. And I really, really appreciate the fact that you've thought about depth at the brick wall so that this wall actually has some materiality and presence that kind of disappears over here where it just feels kind of paper thin. It doesn't have that same sort of rich materiality that, that you get on this front here. But then a, a couple of little things I, I think are gonna be tricky or maybe not even possible. Um, because of the width of the sidewalk, I don't know if you're gonna get a legal sidewalk that's uh, the width here required in Baltimore. I mean, that's really tight here. I don't know how deep this sidewalk is, but it looks like it's only like 10 or 12 feet. So I don't, I don't know how, how if you'll be able to get those stoops, maybe you might have to set back the facade some to really okay. get access. Um, but, but little things like, and this is probably a computer modeling thing, like there's, there's a, a weird line here in the brick that sort of stops there. There's a bit of a shadow here that's probably because of how you were modeling it, but that doesn't really exist here. I, I don't know if that's there are intentional few, or not. So there are a few breaks in the brick itself. Like okay. here's kind of a close up of one of those breaks. This structure has been built up in various um, layers throughout its history. So at one point, I'm guessing around the 30s, the whole facade was replaced going from a three, having it be a two floor structure to being three floors, but not actually gaining all that much height to it. There's, and then there's also been, this piece was built on later, probably around 19, the 1990s is my guess, but it was never fully complete being just a masonry wall, but having a wood structure connected to it. Okay. So, so let me give you my three comments on the facade materiality, and then I'll pass it on. So I, I find that kind of frustrating, like that intersection. Like I just, you know, if you're going to do this material, is there a way to just let this material, maybe you pick up that line and bring it across. Maybe even it has to step to this line. But I find like that intersection where you've done this nice materiality, I, I almost wish you just brought the brick down and, and okay. didn't have this well, the, that's this fourth materiality. The existing there. foundation does is expressed above okay. so that that's kind of representing what is there so it'd be difficult to replace foundation elements and then this to me sort of, sort of has a depth and a materiality but i kind of am losing it back here I like because that looks like brick that almost has the surface of the material painted onto it and maybe, maybe that's the the reality of it but there's kind of a like this feels like a substantial pier but then this feels like it's just kind of paper thin. And I don't really understand, like you've made this end really, really important and it's a corner, it's a major intersection, but then the alley side, you've kind of taken that same material and done it in an even more dynamic way. So I'm kind of like think, feeling like this almost feels as important as that. 
So, you know, I, I almost want this to be hierarchically more significant than that. So maybe it's treated a little more subtly on the back alley side than it is on the street side. And then within the actual mullions themselves, like when I look at this front here, there's sort of one mullion system here and then a different mullion system there. I kind of wish for the sake of the building that there was a little bit more continuity in the, the mullion systems, like either do all of this or, or all of this and not kind of mix it half and half. I just mm -hmm. think just that that continuity would help tie it all together. So, okay. Just a couple thoughts. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ben, for putting this together and presenting this to us today. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about sort of the fundamental idea of the building and um, some of the things that I see that you've done positively and maybe some ideas on how you could expand this into something a little more. Um, I really appreciate the legacy of this building. You want to um, restore it for, you say, your grandfather? Yes. Had a furniture business here? No, so he had a law office there. Or a His law office. His parents had a furniture business. And then it became the a furniture store. business. Um, the idea of this project to expose others to the uh, wonders of craft. I, I do understand Baltimore is rich in um, crafts people. I've been meeting them, uh, whether it's for stained glass or whether it's for uh, turning wood dowels and things all well represented by the craft industry or craftsmen in Baltimore, which I admire. And I think you're off to a good start. Um, I think that um, I would I would like to see it be more expansive in that if it is a uh, an exhibition center where people can see these things, and it's quite fascinating to watch some crafts people restore things. And um, I own an old house, and I am always uh, amazed at some of the uh, things they did. Uh, necessity being the mother of invention, they learn how to do things with with items they don't have. Um, I wondered if you could have expanded this across the block a little bit yes. more. You have a center here, you, you have an alley condition. Um, at first I thought it was a corner condition with two streets, but it's an alley. So uh, as an alley, you have the ability also to perforate the sidewall and uh, people could come through it or, or something. Um, you chose to put your courtyard on the inside, um, which isn't a bad thing, but you've limited your first floor space a little bit. Yes. So you, you might have thought about just picking that up one level and using that whole first floor as your temperance bar, but also from, for some studios mm -hmm. that people could readily see. Maybe you could see it from the street. Maybe it could have larger windows that were more, you know, more like a, um, uh, you know, for, for passer buyers to watch the activities. Um, many years ago, I did the studio theater and I put a box lifted up off the ground, but that was a big exhibition space where it was the nucleus of the building. Um, so you could, you could think about that and then maybe just go a little further because it sounds like there's a legacy of those other buildings with your family also, right? Yes, and 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 use this as a, a starting point for doing what you're doing, which I, again I believe is a good thing. Mm -hmm. So part of this project was an intentional limit in scope, so that's addressing the neighborhood rather than the city at large, because there is a distinct flavor to each neighborhood and the culture surrounding them and the way people should and ha handle their building stock. So this isn't so much as for people to get an in-depth, intensive understanding of preservation work. It's more of a introduction type of building. It won't have the same, if it's too big, it can be intimidating. This is very much an introductory. So people learn how to plaster over cracks in their walls rather than learning ornamental plaster work. Hi, um, thank you for presenting um, and really showcasing um, lots of layers, even adding furniture and kind of detail in it. So I appreciate that quite a bit. Um, 
a few thoughts that I have. Um, you mentioned maxing out the site. Obviously, this, if this is really a historic kind of site, we have to really, did you do any research on whether you're allowed to maximize yes. the site? Yes. So this location is C4 zoning mm -hmm. and it's, the current zoning allows for there to be, if there is a requirement of, if there is a rear yard, it must be 20 feet deep. Mm -hmm. and otherwise it must take up the whole lot size and if there's a side yard it must be 10 feet wide or non-existent so you're allowed to go night um 100 yes wow, okay. okay that's great to know um outside of that um in terms of just the facade i think you know, part of what makes old buildings kind of beautiful is being intention, um, thoughtful on like window placement and the balance of that. Um, so I see like in the front here, as well as their kind of change in scale and some was mentioning of like the kind of curtain above as well. So I think thinking through what is that rhythm and pattern in the facade to kind of help to elaborate some of these textures that you've started to kind of play through, I think would be quite um, interesting. Um, in terms of furniture, um, thank you for placing them. So, uh, some of the second floor, especially this guy down here, circulation wise would be pretty challenging. So really thinking through of like, um, as you're placing furniture, what are the kind of the requirements needed spatially to make the chair to kind of go in and out for circulation to pass through because it's such a small scale project. Um, it's important to kind of think through how the furniture is going to work with circulation in that man. Um, in terms of the courtyard, I don't see any diagrams here on um, just kind of the relationship of sun and how much sun and light is really getting through that space. Um, so just wondering if you kind of thought through that as you were positioning um, the courtyard. Yes, yeah, so the courtyard is not going to get high levels of sunlight mm -hmm. but it'll be a lot it'll be more heavy and ambient light being reflected through the space the main one of the key features I want out of the courtyard is to have an ability to extend activities into it so that there are these these bifold doors that can be opened up and cause the the wet preservation space to be expanded outward into it if necessary but also okay allows for if there is any requirement for air to be circulated naturally due to a power failure or something like that, that you can open this garage door and these doors and it will help with the air circulation. Okay, That's good to know that there's like a garage door and ways that you're kind of connecting back off of this side alley. Um, because it's such a long facade, I think thinking through of how you're really connecting back to the outside um is important to kind of break up that facade as you start to kind of develop openings so I'm glad to see that you kind of have that in the back and started thinking through that a little bit um but overall thank you for um your passion of trying to kind of talk about something that um is really hard in cities of how to develop in a thoughtful way um so yeah yeah, I second that. I really appreciate the sort of family narrative and I think the personal touch, I feel like brings a soul to your project that I don't think is often found in theses. Um, one thing I was just wondering about is sort of the flatness of the facade uh, and adding, you know, the new versus the old. And in part, it makes me feel like when I see this sort of staggered roof line relative to the new curtain wall above it, and then this, um, what do you call it, the uh, form stone in the back. I'm just wondering if there could have been a little a little bit more simplicity to give more deference to the original building. And so maybe there's a reveal and maybe it's standing, you know, a foot or 18 inches. Um, the, the brick wall will be, you know, proud of the curtain wall to kind of give a, a, a sense of like this is first that we are adding to it. Um, right now, it's hard to read what is the most important element on the building because there's so much movement and so many different textures. And so I kind of just want to know where to look first. Um, another comment is just, I don't know if you really need those two doors. Like, I think you probably could get away with like one really nice door. And then there might be some way that you can creatively cut off access to the bar if you need to, or separate that, that circulation. Um, I feel like also in terms of the simplicity, maybe, Formstone is 
representative of old or the formstone and brick are old and curtain wall is new and so maybe you don't need that formstone in the back at all but i think there's some like uh ways in which you can kind of calm down what you created which i think you've done a lot of really cool elements but to give people a priority as to what to look at next um yeah that's it for me um i had a lot of notes and comments um the first, the, the the program is very interesting to me, I think. Um, so whenever um, we approach historic, whenever architects are working in a historic area, we're given these like guidelines. And I think it would be great to have those guidelines actually take, um, you know, go to a place where you can actually see some of those things actually in, in real time, how people are res restoring things and, um, and, and things like that. Um, I think, it, what what would have been um, really interesting, or what what of these historic details that you are keeping and preserving of the building, like doing your own analysis of um, whether it's the cornice or whether it's the the, the sills at the window or the, the the coping line that you that the roof line that you kept these certain um, existing aspects of it that you're um, um, logging and kind of understanding how do you kind of merge the the old and the new or preserve uh, what's old and new. Um, the other thing, um, programmatically, I as soon as you mentioned like this wanting to be a place where you want um, the public to get a better understanding of, I almost want to reverse your bar to the top, and so that that corridor that you're taking us um, uh, along, I guess uh, the the east side having that visitor's corridor um, take, take a more um, public circulation up to um, what could be the top bar. And then as you're, as you're um, ascending some windows in to kind of see what, get people closer to the actual like happenings of the, um, the restora restoration uh, process. And so maybe considering flipping those two um, and even I, I like Bill's idea about uh, pulling that that um, possibly pulling the courtyard to the outside because again you you're, you're creating more surface area that people can kind of by happenstance kind of peek in and look at and get an understanding because right now we're getting lots of wall um, and so if we don't if they don't see it from the outside when you bring them into it how can you start to expose your visitors once they get into the inside to kind of look in and see kind of what's going on um, with the program so to respond to that the, the idea of having the bar be located on the upper one of the upper levels was something I considered and something I've noticed in the neighborhood is there are places where there are classes and activities held, but only limited times during the week. And so you end up having a location along the main street that has a clear level of visibility, but also looks empty for a large amount of the time. So by having this temperance bar located front and center, it is able to make, create this, the visual of a building that's constantly occupied, or at least that's the goal. So classes would have to be held during specific hours with a certain level of supervision by trained um, facilitators. The temperance bar wouldn't quite have the same level of requirements. I think we it's incumbent upon you to, to show that's how you might go through this building. It might be an experience that could be wonderful. And the bar can be part of that, but maybe mm -hmm. not front and center. Maybe you, you get ready mm -hmm. to get a cold ale after you're finished seeing some of the some of the folks. But uh, you know, you you should be helping us how you go through this building. Okay. Yeah, I mean there is a bar that I I mean, yeah, I've seen other bars that were located at the top floor and they end up being unoccupied because they're so distant from the primary activities going on. Like if you look at eight, at the American Visionary of Arts, they have like a 
cafe that is constantly empty because of its distance from the first floor. I think probably what we're all craving is the connection back to the context that we talked about. Is yeah. That, yeah. Um, okay. You know, even in your your elevations of just kind of showing one building, but we're talking about it's just not a fabric. So we're only like we're we're trying to figure out how to kind of connect people from the outside down in this building because there's so much brick and glass that we're seeing and not really allowing people to have that experience of all the stuff happening inside. Right. What what are the, the ways that we can kind of draw people into this space instead of just thinking it's kind of just another building like on the block of the yeah, yeah. We think about it as sort of an L type big brick walls, no up. Mm -hmm. And then I think moving, moving the courtyard out, at least on the second level, maybe the relief that we need to make it an interesting having through this building. Okay. I, I actually almost feel the opposite. I mean, there's something cool about a, a big solid brick wall. I mean, it feels like an alley facade to me. It feels like it's not trying to be a public facade, um, you know, which makes me think maybe the back is like completely wide open and it's stepped and terraces and and you get a lot more of that sort of uh, light and stuff from the back. But um, but there's something about this big solid plane, you know, that I find kind of compelling because it's not really something you see. It tells me instantly that it's not a residential building because if it was, there'd be bedroom windows and bathroom windows and all that stuff. Hmm? I got a lot of brick walls I could sell you. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, just looking at the composition on the side facades, I mean, I, I, I kind of find the solidity unexpected and in that way kind of interesting. So, you know, I'm okay with that. I, I do think that, um, I, I wonder if the bar is really in the right orientation in, inside the actual space. Because when you're sitting at that bar, you're kind of looking at a back bar and then circulation and an exterior wall. I mean, I, I almost feel like it wants, wants to be flipped. So you, when you come in on this corner, you come in at where the seats are and you're not kind of walking around the back bar to get to the main seating. Like I wonder what I'm sitting at that bar, kind of what I'm seeing on that op opposite mm -hmm. side. Um, it just doesn't quite feel comfortable to me yet. Like how I get in, get to my seat, how I'm talking with people and what I'm actually seeing when I'm in there. Does that make sense at all? Yes. I mean, there, there probably was a really strong reason why you put the seats on the stair sides. So. Yeah. The. The. The key thing was to have a um to have like keep this corridor that goes straight back for easy access. There is like the bar this bar is kind of set up on with modular units on wheels, so it can be rearranged based on if there is that requirement, like because there's kind of that aspect of like it's one thing to have it drawn out, but to see how people actually are using it is a different matter. So if they find that this is a setup that needs some adjustments, that is possible to adjust it. What I was thinking is yeah. like I don't, I almost feel like this wants to be the back bar. And when you walk in, it's a row of seats right there that you see right the moment you came in. And when you're at that back bar, when you're at the seating looking across, you know, this whole thing could widen out if you didn't have to have this kind of two three separate rooms okay. of circulation. It would just yeah. make it feel more spatial. So you come in and you have seats on that side. That makes and sense. And this is a back bar and you can pull that in and, and just get it a lot more spatial and inviting. It's okay. just there, there's three rows of kind of circulation and they're already a very narrow space. Okay. Um, I mean, one question I have is why the bar? Like why did that program? And I'm just wondering if you did a program analysis of the neighborhood, do they, they need a bar? Yes. Yeah, so. This, this is a temperance bar, which means that there's no alcohol being served. Okay. There are so many bars already in Hamden. Yeah. And mo most social places do serve alcohol. So this is kind of the idea of, oh, this is an alternative place for people who don't drink or don't feel comfortable being around alcohol can go there. Mm -hmm. So, but it also can function as a coffee shop, which there's kind of a congestion of the already existing coffee shops in the area yeah so. i mean i'm just wondering because i feel like i'm a little bit familiar with the neighborhood and i feel like there are already quite a lot of these types of spaces and i'm just wondering if there could have been some other commercial activity that maybe speaks more to the what else is happening in the building mm -hmm. that like perhaps it's like a, a specialty hardware store so that people so, okay go ahead. actually 
there is a specialty hardware store that I mentioned okay. on the map that has been a neighborhood staple for many decades. So I considered that, but it seems like it would kind of be okay. taking away something that's already okay. from something that's there already. Yeah, I feel like I feel like sorry. I, I feel like this, the, where the bar is, if that area were the studio space and you can have these garage doors that open up and people are um, working there during the day, I feel like that could create a really interesting draw, in, in my opinion, to understand what, it, what, what goes on there. And, you know, it's almost like when you were seeing people like, a, like an open kitchen, like behind the scenes, mm -hmm. like making stuff. Like, I feel like that would be um, an interesting, unique draw. So this is somewhat of an active alley. So that does put limits as to what kind of exposure, like, do I want a courtyard to be open to an open alley? I mean, an active alley, like people have past this space are houses and garages that connect to the alley. So there are people who are like driving in and out of their, their block from there. So that's kind of a constraint that I've had with this site as to like how much exposure can be there. Signage and so currently there is a billboard on the sign on the side of the building. So it seems like a feature that I that is undesirable to have. I love that picture. That's awesome. Look at all those great signs way down the street. Yeah. So. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, that's. Yeah, that's an interesting point that I wish I explored more. But it seems like currently there's a trend to remove signage that goes into the street like that. So I figured it was kind of a question of, is this something that I want to set up as a new trend in the neighborhood, that there should be these signs projecting into the sidewalk space, airspace? I mean, have you considered mural art? Yes, I did consider mural art that seems kind of a, a layer of personalization that should be judged based on the uh, users of the space that, you know, it's one thing to design a building, but to be using it is a personal level mm -hmm. that kind of needs to have its own flavor develop before inserting it. My only other question is the courtyard. What is that materiality? So, just like cinder block or yeah, so the courtyard has pieces of an earlier foundation jutting into it, but it's largely letting it go back to grass. The below the floorboards is a dirt floor, and it would so this courtyard is existing in a space that is kind of deteriorated, the walls are falling apart. So being allowing nature kind of take its toll on this area, mm -hmm. but then to build up around it. I'm, I'm the, sorry, I was referring to the wall. The wall. So I was thinking it would be more of a rougher CMU block, allowing for kind of an, a level of aging to take place because of not it, it being a highly polished surface. But it's one wall, it's just a brick wall. Yes. So the... This, this wall here is composed of existing brick masonry. What about this? Did you use that wall as part of the courtyard? Yes, that wall is part of the courtyard in this design. Yeah, yeah. I just want to speak about the interior and historic preservation kind of only applying to the exterior in a lot of, I mean, this is just kind of how it's done where it's all about neighborhood uh, look and feel. So it is more urban context, but I always question whether we um, like 
were all the existing walls newer of a newer generation? Like they are unimportant or do not inform you? Of yes. Anything? So the existing walls are, the existing walls are large, seem to be, the interior walls are of a newer fabric. The, it would be mostly relying on the existing kind of floor structure and heights that exist allow it, along with evening out the discrepancy that exists here. So the floor heights in this front portion is preserved, and, but the interior walls are not. Would you be replacing the floor with something that resembles the joist that was used? Like, is there anything to study there? Yes, so there is pl plenty to study. The, the floor joists are in, in this portion, they are in suitable condition where it, they could, would probably just require a little reinforcing, but they could be salvaged and reused. There is a little bit of um, unevenness to the current floor system. So it would just needs some elements to create a flat surface. So I think if you were to do something like that, your interior spaces would look a lot different if you were to kind of expose structure or show um, in a similar way that you just have that corner. Like that's not something that's historic. It's a historically used uh, material, but that wasn't there before, right? So you're kind of demonstrating something and introducing a new material. In it's kind of almost ironic yeah. um, introduction of that material. Yes. Uh, and so I think, I mean, if this is just kind of a playground or an experimental place, you could expose a lot more structure on the interior and have a less finished looking space. Yeah, I mean, there are elements of like the wallpaper on the, the wallpaper, the historic wallpaper that is on the brick bearing walls is still there. So there's kind of this aspect of like, if I was able, to, it's more of limits in what can be rendered in the software to, so currently I was kind of thinking on like, there are some images where the, it's like the idea of having this be preserved by being removed and applied to a canvas for more security and then hung on the wall. So that can be seen in the office and computer labs, but yeah, there is that aspect of maybe some of the historic elements can be kind of unveiled, un unveiled such as the like masonry foundation that's being present in the courtyard. Thank you. Hi, Ben. Hello. Uh, it's been a, a been a long and interesting journey, and I'm so glad to see your project come to fruition. Um, that perspective there has been a a question mark for me and and sort of wrestling with that as you've been talking about and and also the excellent feedback that you've been getting um and in particular i appreciate kind of the irony of the applied new old uh stone i think there's something you know provocative in that um and yes, I am thinking a little bit of uh, some of the Venturian uh, dialogue that occurred quite quite a long time ago. However, um, in terms of the tectonics of your project and sort of the syntax of your project, the thing that's giving me the most pause at the moment is your glazing system. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I wonder whether the meter of that glazing system has something to do with the internal structure or is it is it marking something in a modular way that's sort of a question that i would normally ask um and i'm not sure i can discern that but the one comment i would have is i i wonder whether a little bit lighter touch where the glass system uh comes and interfaces with the brick would set off the brick surface as an object because you are featuring it as as a wall that contains a lot of history and a lot of nuance um i wonder whether dematerializing that glazing system 
maybe even experimenting with momentless systems, uh, non non mullion based systems, might give that kind of subtle push to push the the wall surface forward. And I'm sure some of our uh, historic preservation experts here might have something to say about that. Thank you. Minokin. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, a spider system. And, and then the critical detail of this uh, it is, is that edge that meets the glazing system. Yes, and the corners. Um, I did appreciate those comments, but, but you know, what special material might you select to make that transition between this very special brick wall and the glazing system? And then what is the syntax of the glazing system? So. so they would not, it would not be transparent glazing. It would be kind of a ref reflective of a light inside rather than exposing interior workings. That's kind of what you said. The system for me kind of visually falls apart, like here. You know, where it's this really simple, almost repetitive system, not quite repetitive, and all this still sort of in these corners, it just doesn't resolve itself, and it's visually just not complete there. And you can fix that in your model. Yeah. Yes, so thanks a lot, Ben. Uh, it's been a, a great project. Uh, Having been inside of the building, um, I can tell you this was a challenging project uh, in so many ways. And I think you've done a, a fantastic job with that. Um, I, I do appreciate uh, a number of these comments. And I think, you know, one of the things we talked about and something that with a National Register eligible building is the notion of character defining features. What What is it that, that made the building what it was and and how do you do interventions then that celebrate those you know without uh you know, taking them off the you know taking them off the table um so for example somebody was just pointing out the cornice there i think i think there could be ways to to make that cornice pop a little bit more the historic cornice uh of right. of the building maybe it's actually pushing that glazing in and and just doing a simple molded brick almost like a water table in a 18th century building um, just to push it back give it a little so so you don't have such a flush wall there um, to, to just help you see and peek at that outline of the original roof and and cornice um, so some things like that uh, I, I think I also agree and we've also talked about this that the form stone at the back I, I think it sort of takes away from what you got going at the front and it sends a mixed message but that's that's for you to play with and I still think a nice big painted sign in the middle of that flat brick wall a historic, painted sign, uh, you know, whether it's advertising your building and its program or whatever, uh, would, would, to me, would be the piece de resistance. But uh, great, great job. Really, really have enjoyed this. Again, congratulations, Ben, on getting to this level, seeing, being part of the team that saw it through here. Um, I'm actually going to take a little bit of a different perspective from Donald. Um, and say Sorry, oh, that's me. Um, actually, I'm gonna be more on Jamie's side. I'd love that glazing system to actually project out and almost overlap the steppy steppy of the brick because historic preservation is about history and history is about layers. And history is about exposing the layers and understanding the time frame. And that was a gesture that could have been a little bit more exciting. Um, also, overall, in terms of the design of the exterior, um, I'd love for you to be bolder. And this is sort of a master's mm -hmm. thesis sort of statement and not just a regular studio response. I would love your gestures to be bolder and your future to be bolder and more emphatic. And the fact that a lot of your gestures are very flat is 
confessing your hesitancy. So the cornice in the front turns into cap flash, you know, of the other step where it, it could have been more. Um, one of the big things that we had talked about in terms of formstone is evocative of the Renaissance Bramante's rustication of Italian villas and that's great. So I understand it, embrace it in the front. I don't understand the gesture in the back. Um, I agree with many comments that you know, that could have not been there. Um, and then the last comment is scale. So again, the mullion system that you've got shown is more evocative of a building four times its size. Mm -hmm. So do you have any idea how much, how big one of those glazing panels would be? Yeah, so largely they're about 30 inches wide. They alternate between like 18 and 30 inches wide. And the height kind of varies between like these are the tallest and they're about a little under five feet tall. Okay, so 30 by 48. If I could ask you to give thought to being a window cleaner <laughs> and having to clean in those small little panels, mm -hmm. that's a gesture that it could have been. That's why when I'm reading that perspective, I feel like the building is tremendously sized and knowing Hamden and, and being there with you across the street and looking at the building, the building is more dwarfed and um, there's that. And, and as we had talked about is the gesture of this is the gateway going east from Falls Road, that major north-south artery in Baltimore and then turning along the avenue. And this is the front building on the north side is, is the way you've approached it, heralding this avenue as much as it could have. Um, and then I did promise a last comment. Last comment, I've always sort of questioned how glass skyscrapers meet the sky. It just, it, it, it's boom, oh, we stopped. We hit a zoning requirement, we hit a program requirement or the financial requirement. The whole idea of the beauty of an articulated cornice is saying, hey, we're hitting the end, as opposed to flat brick, calling it a day. So I'd ask you to think about that gesture of the cap, sort of the menor, the, no, the, the yarmulke of <laughs> the building. It's. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I wish that was a little bit thought of, you know, you're seeing the, um, the health clinic, with the, which was your family's uh, furniture store, that has a very pronounced cornice, and how you could relate to that, I think also could help. Congratulations, Ben. Thank I you. think some of the strongest parts of the, your your study, which were the historical analysis as well as the precedent analysis, are not being reflected there, um, which is a shame because I really enjoyed the work that you you did um, in the first semester and and reading the paper. Thanks to James' hard work with you. Um, I, I think you did a great job. It, it was a tough project, despite the small scale. And um, and Don Don already mentioned that it it was a tiny site, but it was a very very nuanced project. And we all realized that. And I I appreciate. I mean, and I really admire you for for taking the challenge and and going through this process. Um, we are done. And I really want to invite you, now that you got all these fabulous comments and suggestions, I want to tell you one thing that I tell, I always tell physics students that you are not done. I want you to be open. I want you to take a note of all these comments that you have received from every single jury here, because these are things that are going to be brought up in, in your whole career. To see, to identify the weaknesses, the strength, and to work on them, to take advantage of these three months that you are going to have, because 
this is, I mean, all of these comments and suggestions are going to help you build up your career. So um, take advantage of them. And again, congratulations. Thank you. All right, congratulations, Ben. We're going to rotate. We're going to rotate 90 degrees to our left now. One minute. Since we ran out of time, you're doing glass walls like this. Um, so we don't have much, much, yeah, if you want to point it a little bit better, but we don't have enough, enough cable, sorry. Hello? Yes. Okay. So, um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Christy Santana. And um, first, before I start doing my presentation, I really wanted to thank my professors that had helped me throughout the semester, uh, Professor Williams and Professor uh, Brian Kelly, as well as Professor Abrams. Um, and also, I wanted to thank my family that also has helped me uh, go throughout this whole journey. Um, so, okay, so first, um, the title of my thesis is Light Forms Function where it's exploring the use of light in instructional spaces. Um, light is essential for understanding design as well as living and working in the structures. This thesis will investigate the programs, different lighting strategies, and typological precedents used by design schools. 
It would also study methods of capturing, rerouting, darkening, and framing natural light. And uh, because due to the amount of time students spend in the school, it is essential to design primarily for the visual requirements of the users um, and their expected functions inside a given space. And this is because schools may serve as a student's second home. The site I chose to elaborate my thesis is actually this building, the Architecture School of the University of Maryland. Uh, I'm proposing to redesign the whole building and fulfill the needs of expansion that we're currently uh, going through. There you go. So first, I'm gonna run to uh, five sections. The first one will be, I will talk, you, I will talk about challenges, then uh, lighting strategies and architecture. And then from there, I'm gonna talk about the analysis criteria and finally about my proposal uh, program. Uh, first, uh, one of the challenges that I saw throughout this project was uh, how, how to make light uh, be a space, how to create lighting and make it a space, a livable spaces, and how can it shape and guide us throughout it? Um, because light sets the scene for building performance, clarifies the purpose, and shapes the space. Uh, the lighting design is integrally a part of the building design. However, um, to create such a livable environment, there is the need to consider the building orientation, aperture size and placement, and also as well as the interior geometry and surface properties. And all that come together with the skies constantly changing light to create a unique and dynamic uh, illumination conditions. Next, um, I started the design to school. Uh, as you may already become familiar with today, we can say that, um, um, here, I don't know what happened. Sorry, it was the wrong slide. Okay, so uh, for uh, first, um, I started uh, studying the current school. And as you can see here, these are the elevations of the school from north, side, east, south, and west. So as you can see here, um, uh, the design as you may become familiar to date, or maybe uh, you've been here as a professor or a student, it can be said that it has some functional aesthetic design. Uh, and by that, I mean it emphasizes uh, utility over the experience. And we can witness that. Uh, there you go. And he, oh, sorry, this laptop is going. There you go. Okay, so um, as we can see in these pictures that I took earlier, the uneven light that we have throughout the interior spaces, for instance, right here, we can see we do have an aperture over here, an opening of the window, but as it goes out, uh, throughout, uh, expanding throughout the spaces, you can see it does not diffuse clearly, as well as uh, on the um, on the hallways right here, we can actually see over there, experiencing how the light is not distributing all the way to here. And as well, the skylight right here, if you're noticing, it's just the light just goes straight down. That at some sometime the day, it can just, just have a direct light that would just become uncomfortable for you to be under it. Uh, also, um, Go to the next slide right here. The classrooms, the classroom either has too much light or too much light or either um, no light at all, as we can see on the bottom uh, left picture. Let me actually use this to hold me. Okay, so we can see here this uh, classroom right here does have introduced a lot of light in this area, but however, we also have this classroom that has only small opening, but then at the same time, on the front of the, the classrooms, it has this darkness. So um, as well, here is the great space where you can also see how the light just directly goes down, but it does not expand throughout the spaces. Over here, uh, we have two openings in this classroom, for instance, but uh, you can still see the darkness. So uh, there is a need for artificial lighting throughout the building. And from there, um, I started working on a couple of sketches um, to do uh, charcoal drawings and uh, to have or to study different daylighting reflections. And this helped me to better understand how light diffuses across the spaces and what function it might serve or become to create an artful light in the solution. And also uh, did a couple of uh, models 
study models that you can see it on the table over there. Um, let me go back to this slide right here. Um, here where you can see your appreciation and see how the reflection of light changes throughout different apertures. For instance, right here, there's just a small a square opening, but it introduces this 3D lighting experience. Um, same thing as this one, it introduces lining, lines of light that could uh, create a promenade. And from here, right here, there is another uh, type of lighting, which is the skylight, it's just lineal. Uh, skylight right here that can uh, produce lighting just on the floor and highlights uh, for the exhibition or the use of space that could be used this for. Um, next, let me go back here. Oh, and then from there, um, uh, to in order to reinforce my design, I started looking at a couple of precedents, um, how they actually use the light and um, um, in living spaces and what function they use it for. And I decided to uh, divide it into four principles. The first one will be moment of pause. So as you can see here, um, uh, for instance, a mosque uses the light as something to praise, to look up for, or as a reference of God. Um, the other one is riddle of movement. How can the apertures create this illusion of lighting that could create uh, spaces and um, lead you the way, um, as well as uh, vertical lighting. Um, this one uses um, an angle apertures that uh, this it helps with not having direct lighting into the building, and also openness and flexibility. Um, I think this one, um, this principle helps to use the lighting and have uh, lets you have more open spaces and diffuse the more light the more lighting that you can. Um, then from there, I started applying those uh, principles into uh, my thesis into this project, and I thought about how can I use this uh, raining light and in what function could it be. So I thought about using it on the art gallery, as you can see here. Um, I, I have this openings throughout the ceiling that could uh, diffuse a light right straight down here. So it produces this, it highlights the wall where it can be uh, some exhibitions be uh, presented over here, so, but it does not damage the artwork. And it produces this experience where uh, the halo of light. Uh, so it, it brings like more significance. Um, as well as I've also thought about creating this promenade of lighting. Uh, this one I thought it could be used in an entry just to uh, create this movement. Um, over here, um, I was thinking and where could I use uh, vertical lighting, um, but still not have this direct lighting towards the students or the user experience. So here, my idea was to maybe I could use that in the presentation spaces, just like right now. Um, the light uh, would not be direct to the boards or to the students, but it will still diffuse it in order to um, um, add to the lighting or diffusing light inside the, the, the room. Um, here, you can just see how this looks in that section. Um, another uh, possibility that I thought of, uh, opportunity I thought was uh, using it on the um, offices um, where we have this offset on the balconies, create these balconies and offset um, um, back so the light could also not stop on the floor but continue to twirl the floors uh, on the ground below. Um, over here, uh, there is another uh, technique that I found that I, I wanted to use it on, on the studios where it's a clear story windows um, that forms this um, rhythm of movement, but at the same time, um, uh, in, introduces light into the spaces, but also allows the students to have this open area to gather together and also uh, leave a space for our presentations, for our boards that we have throughout our classes. And here, I um, also thought about um, having this small gathering presentations that opens up more um, gathering throughout the students and the professors, and also having more privacy when um, 
uh, the, the presentations that we have, but also in to introduce the lighting that would not affect uh, the conversation or, or the activity that it's happening. Also uh, for the offices, I thought about having this skylight over here and introducing it with this enclosed area, which is the indoor courtyard. But at the same time, because of this opening, it would uh, expand the lighting throughout the spaces. And it would not be direct, it would just diffuse it. And also I uh, thought about have introducing this uh, skylight over here, but at the same time have this openings throughout the, the corridors. So that way it could also, it could be another way to diffuse the light but not, uh, like I said, not direct. Uh, the next one, I thought, uh, what could I use uh, at some lighting strategies that could create this openness and flexibility of how to use the spaces? For instance, in the auditorium, uh, right now we don't have any uh, uh, um, opportunities or any windows on the uh, current uh, lecture hall that we have right now, but then I thought maybe we introduce this linear lighting. Um, it could, that it would not affect the, whatever uh, the presentation that is happening, but it just illuminates the spaces for you to uh, create this prominent of how to walk throughout the spaces. Um, as well as I uh, thought about introducing terraces on the uh, outside of the building, just so it could, add to the gathering spaces, or it could also be another opportunity for um, presentations outdoors whenever the weather allows it. Um, later, um, this is how, um, this is in the couple of pictures, these are the elevations, um, how the, each form of uh, the lighting uh, that I produce makes this eclecticism form that it's not a uh, symmetrical, but because of the lighting, it makes it this eclecticism form. Um, and then uh, from, from that, uh, I wanted to talk about the sighting and how do I um, approach it. So first I thought about the first thing that I thought about since we have this um, rough on the slope going down from here, uh, I thought about, if we decide to build, uh, to uh, place the building closer to, to north, the, that way it could <clears throat> easily connect to, to the to to the to the outdoors and probably had the opportunity to have a green roof in this area that would connect the students directly to the classrooms, um, and also. As I was doing my research in the school, um, I learned that uh, there is some planning, uh, master planning going on in the campus where they're also thinking on expanding the school, which is right here. And also they're thinking on elongating this uh, mall right here just to have more uh, landscape. Uh, so then I thought that that could, I took this uh, as a reference or as an inspiration to elongate uh, the part of the, <clears throat> of the park right here. And then, uh, so that would also add to the more gathering spaces for the students or the staff. And then I also thought about enclosing this area right here, because currently right now we have a parking lot, but I thought maybe because of the grid and because of the water runoff, it will be uh, an opportunity just to add more green areas and have uh, uh, gathering spaces, as well as having uh, the pyramid that we have outside, have some seating, or, uh, seating arrangements outside, just so we can all look at it and appreciate it and have a more significant out of it, just not just pass by, but also uh, uh, see uh, our experience. From there, um, the proposed program that I'm doing uh, has, uh, ground square footage of 72,577, which is about 200, 2,500 more than what it currently is. Uh, for instance, right here, uh, it, would, it would introduce, it would have 12 design and studios compared that we have right now, we have only nine. <clears throat> and we also, uh, I'm also introducing um, study rooms at the studios, which is, uh, uh, we currently don't have those, but then um, the art gallery, and then um, also adding a cafe area for the students or for the professors, and uh, terraces as well. 
So here you can compare uh, how uh, this was uh, this program could help with the spending uh, the current program that we have right here. And to take a closer look to the floor plans uh, right here, uh, we have two four for two main entrances right here. This is uh, egress uh, stairs right here, and this from north to west to east. And uh, for this this area right here focuses only on the creative uh, spaces, meaning it includes uh, the studio area and the classrooms, which is closer to the north. And then also here, uh, I'm, I'm giving, uh, I'm providing some study rooms or brainstorming areas. And over here on the close to the south, also I'm doing um, presentation areas. Here is when we have big presentations, just like today, we could use this area right here. And like I mentioned, or like I uh, show you in the render is we're not gonna have direct lighting. The lighting will spread through here and then diffuse all the way to this area. So it will not be direct. And then as well, uh, this area will focus on the labs. And the reason why I decided to have this on the west side of the building was because since students uh, usually stay late at the date <clears throat> or tonight, uh, this is the lighting uh, from the west. Is, um, it stays more uh, <clears throat> during the date. It's more constant. Um, and then on the other side right here, we have the gallery, the gallery space, which uh, I call it this, uh, the learning, the learning, uh, a block or the learning messing, sorry. And then from here, it will take you down to the to the uh, auditorium, to the lecture hall that it's gonna be, that it has uh, two floors, two floors. So I that would also help with expanding um, um, the quantity or the students that could uh, assist in the, in the hall. And uh, over here, I included uh, the library, which is on the, mornings, uh, which is on the east side, which uh, it has the light that, um, and the east light, which is more uh, um, the light that's in the mornings. And as well as um, over here, this is the area where I'm introducing, uh, having the opportunity to use uh, the cafe area. And then over here, it's just close to this terraces, the others terraces, uh, as you saw on the other, on the past render. And here is uh, the second floor. This is the studios. It's a typical floor. Uh, it's it's um, designed in the same way. And then, and this which this one over here on the west on the east side, you can see the second floor of the library. We're gonna have two floors of the library just so we can expand on the learning and have the the students have more accessible for more. Um, um, product for more uh, books to learn from. And here it shows the uh, auditorium second floor, which also has access to the library. And here on uh, this corridor right here, it also will lead you to the outdoors over here. This is where the green roof um, is at over here. And then on the third floor, like I said, the studios and the classroom is a typical floor. And then uh, it would also, this one, the third floor, it would connect to the office, some demonstration offices right here that uh, would also have, just like it has right now, uh, in an interior courier right here. But that also, like I mentioned earlier, this will help also to diffuse the light in throughout the spaces. And like I mentioned before, I also offset the floor just to create this balcony. Um, so the light would not stop on the floor, it will continue down to the second floor. Um, and then from that, uh, to conclude this presentation, uh, this, this, this project uh, will provide new opportunities to experience natural lighting inside, inside according to the function of a space, a building, and at the same time, create comfortable spaces that can be considered as a second home and a place that you would like to come back to. Um, thank you. I'm open for any comments and questions that you may have. Yes. You started off by industrial and mm. And then you go to the so, Could you repeat the question? Because that cannot be heard to people at home. As, as I recall, and 
seeing this early on and also what you said in the beginning, you started off by doing an analysis of this building and the lighting of this building, the School of Architecture building, right? Right. But you have a new building. Could you just talk a little bit about how you morphed into that decision? What okay. what caused you to sort of not do this building and do this? Sure. So first, uh, my idea with uh, deciding to choose this site right now, uh, the architecture building, was because um, I thought about this is the place that makes the architect. So why not create a space that would lead them to be what they want to be in the future and to create a space that they can be comfortable with and have the opportunities to be creative, to learn. Um, so that's why I thought maybe this is what an architect pretty much starts from. This is how an architect becomes an architect. So I thought, why not start from, from there, from there, designing a building that can provide you with the opportunities, with the skills. Um, so yes. <laughs> Thank you. So you you analyzed <clears throat> this building for its lighting. And how did you then make a jump to another building and demonstrate that the concepts that you have are more appropriate, allow for more space, are better for the way architects work? Um, so, is there a metric that you can point to or a process? Uh, we're all familiar with Corb's wonderful drawings of windows at corners and how the light affects, you know, the, the wall surfaces or those textures and what have you. I mean, how do you, how do you prove your thesis? I see. Okay. So first, as you mentioned, the process first, as uh, as I was starting to think of what thesis or what side to choose, I started thinking on my uh, the experience that we have in the building and see like the pictures I showed you earlier and see how the actual user experience lives or, or feels within the interior of the building. So that's what led me or uh, pushed me to how, why not to make this uh, more uh, lighting or to introduce more lighting to your lighting because as a student, um, I have experiences that either if you're not on the table that's close to the window, you're just in the dark spot. And I haven't, like, I don't think um, that that doesn't feel uh, comfortable enough to decide and say, uh, okay, I'm going to stay here in the school until night or so. So that's what uh, led me to uh, having the idea of why not renovate it or have new, provide new opportunities to architect, to this architecture school. Did, did you undertake a, a study of, scientific study of the kind of lighting levels you need in various situations like sitting at your desk, or sitting in a library reading a book or walking down the hallway has that been part of your study i don't see it up here but sort of like well you need this many foot candles or you know lumens or whatever it is in this area for this kind of task did you do anything like that um or is it is it all experiential like or or typological i suppose that you see on the motif inspirations over there Yes, one is a uh, one by typological precedence first, just to see how the lights being introduced in another projects. But also I wanted to take back from the user, just from the user experience. I did not do any uh, study within uh, the food candles, uh, but I did went by the, how would this space will be filled or feel more comfortable with the lighting. Um, or the darkness at the same time and how comfortable, like, because I really wanted to make a building that you really want to come back to, like, stay. Just like I mentioned, the school is pretty much, uh, that's a second home for, for us, for the professors, even uh, the students, because we spend a lot of time here. Right, yes. Sorry, I should forget to add that. So yes, so there is some psychological um, impacts that has with the lighting, for instance, just by um, it could help you with the learning, it could also affect you on your sight, uh, on your eyes inside. Um, it could also give you this um, um, 
um, energy or to continue in the classrooms or uh, even, uh, um, yeah, sorry, I lost my thought. <laughs> Pretty much, <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely say in a project about light, you have to be really precise. Mm -hmm. And I think using software to your benefit to really analyze how successful you are in creating sort of ambient as well as, um, you know, atmospheric lighting conditions. I'm looking at your floor plans specifically, and I'm not convinced that they're gonna be that much different than what we currently have in this building right now. Um, I see a lot of really dark pockets. And I'm also just wondering if you could have used your building orientation to your advantage. So do you really want the, like you have these like little studio pinup areas to be like this big blank wall when you have studio spaces with students who want that natural light in the north where they're not gonna get a lot of it. And so I just think that even in sort of the programming of the, the configuration that there could have been a lot more finessing to make sure you're optimizing light where it's needed and then um, kind of camouflaging or, or veiling it when you, you don't need it as much. Um, I'm, oh, I guess I'm a little taken aback because I'm not sure, I, I, for one, I didn't realize you were building a new building for a while. So I was like, oh wait, reconfigure um and i'm just wondering in general it, it seems almost as if you were just modifying this building you're not doing that right no i'm just okay. signing the whole building yes. this whole new building i'm i'm surprised by this because it feels like you're really kind of using it's almost as if you just took the foundation of what you have right now and then are kind of building something from it and i feel like you could have been a lot more liberated in designing something with a completely different footprint or a completely different orientation um and so it doesn't really feel particularly, uh, it feels a little bit conventional. And I'm just wondering if there are ways that you could reconfigure it to the advantage and to the narrative that you really are creating. And you have all these like really beautiful moments, but there's, they feel very small. And I just kind of want to see a larger gestural effort to create light throughout. I see. Um, so to go back to your comment about orientation, um, my idea about placing it, uh, function or each program where they are right now. Uh, like I mentioned before, my idea of having the studios on the west side right here in the class, the studios of this are and have this lighting strategy over here. Um, it was because during on the, oh, sorry, on the west side, uh, we have the afternoon light and it's the strongest and the hot, the hottest one. But because of that, I decided not to have regular windows just on the wall, but have it on the ceiling. That way it could diffuse better. So that was my my reason why the studios are on the west uh, area of the building within the classrooms, uh, because on the north light, on um, the north side over here in this area, it has the least light, but all the most constant. That's why also the classrooms are in this area because the, there are some classrooms that are late in the afternoons. Um, and this area in the library, the library closes in the afternoon. So that's why I thought of putting in this on the east area, just so we can guess, we can get that morning light through in this area. Same thing with the um, auditorium. I have uh, over here, I thought about adding this apertures over here, just so we can also get uh, the morning light uh, from the from the east. So that was my idea of how we end each program within the building. So, well, thank you for your presentation and um, really kind of just coming here and thinking through of how to make this building better. Um, <laughs> sure. I think this is a tough one because I'm sure there's a lot of um, emotions behind this building <laughs> and all of that. Right. So, yes. very bold of you to do. Um, when you first started out and started kind of talking through these different models and all of like your sketches and stuff, um, there seemed to be a lot of richness and thoughts around form and how light kind of can relate to that. And then there was a huge jump um, where the building's form don't necessarily seem to relate back much to this. It seems to relate to like individual rooms and then just kind of placing them together in a spatial way. Um, so I just wonder if you missed a moment of like 
how you came up with this massing that relates back to this light and kind of diving deeper into if this is all about light forms and light a light, a light analysis, um, how is that being done outside of just kind of program and thinking through like moments of where light is kind of trickling through, but how does it affect the context? How does it affect the materials and the form of the building? All of your renderings just show white walls um, and not really, really considering how light washes on different textures and kind of thinking through all of those kind of moments. Um, so I, I, I just wish you dived a little bit deeper deeper into if this is a lighting study, like really allow that to um, dictate your form and material choices and everything. Instead of feeling almost to your point, I thought it was just like the same floor plan that you kind of just reshifted and added light elements. So you kind of missed an opportunity to really allow that to shape shape your design a little bit. Yeah, um, to get back on that, on that process, uh, my process while designing this building was um, not designing it from the outdoors, from the other, from the others, or the envelope of the building. I started from the interior within the user experience and what lighting uh, strategies could make the user the user experience better. So that's why you you see here the different forms that they're not um, they're not the same. Like they're not. I guess because of different shapes, they don't seem connected. But the reason for that was because it was it, the design started from the user experience, and then it, at the end, it connected everything together, just like a um, eclecticism design. That's the forms that how everything got joined together. I um, yeah, I I agree that that light is a is um is a hard it's a hard for. Yes. <laughs> a strategy to to tackle. I, I do like how you are bringing a lot of um, your your topic personal, like if especially being in this building, and it sounds like you know there are a lot of dark niches and spaces in this building, and you want to improve on that. I think um, going back, a lot of us are going back to the siting because I think if you do want to optimize how much light enters into your building, we know that a, that a east east-west elongation of a, a rectangular bar mm -hmm. gets um, gets the, um, the the maximum amount of, of solar light into your space. And starting from there and then maybe carving out courtyard spaces, maybe um, even submerging some areas or, or, or um, um, creating some vertical height with some areas and kind of breaking down that mass so that a lot of these programmatic spaces that you're talking about um, get even more light. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, yeah, it could be a, a going back to the siting and location, um, starting out diagrammatically, how, what, what shape or form maximizes the, the amount of, um, of solar gain in, in a majority of part of your, of your floor plate. And then kind of doing some diagram, doing some programmatic studies on okay, now where where are my studios want to be, or maybe dependent on circulation and views and um, and and things like that. But yeah, I, I do appreciate the the um, the wanting to to dive into this because it it it's a it's a problem. <laughs> it's a problem. <laughs> what I'm hearing what I'm hearing is is that um, is that architecture. Uh, while it may foreground an issue like light or social justice or materiality or structure or use or you name it, uh, that architecture is actually multivalent and requires the architect to deal with the whole, even though she or he may foreground a particular issue. And so this is maybe a, this is maybe a, a good lesson for future thesis students to think about the idea that while a particular issue may come to the foreground, the, the entirety of the body of architecture must be addressed in order to have it be successful. And that can actually help to inform things. Materiality can inform light. Um, structure can inform light, uh, and so on and so on and so forth. So it's just sort of, sort of what I'm hearing is, is that by foregrounding something to the exclusion of other things, 
it's it's possible to get into a, a place where things get kind of murky. Sorry to jump in, but as a as a committee member, I sort of felt obliged. Okay, I have a, I have a couple of thoughts. There are a few things I really really like, but I think there's one or two fundamental missteps that I would really like you to think about as you you move forward thinking about these issues with light. So I love the sketches at the beginning, but the, the sketches to me uh, portray like a more dramatic light rather than sort of a soft ambient work light. And the fact that then you've used that in the entry sequence, right when I come into this north entry and I have these dramatic sort of slots of light in the corridor, that tells me what this whole building is about because you've made that a, a key element at the very entrance to, to your building. And so I think that's a strong sort of reinforcement. And it actually, to me, ties back very closely to sort of some of the, the sketches that you've done that have these sort of slots of light. But I, th I think there's like one fundamental misstep and I'm gonna to point to it. Um, if light and ambient light and comfort is, for the users is really important, this building's just way too deep. Um, I mean, this is, I don't know how many feet it is. I'm not gonna speculate on that. I don't know if it's 80 feet or 100 feet or whatever. But I really worry about what's in here. You talked about, you know, some people in studio sit next to a window and some people are inboard. But I kind of think, you know, that's going to be the same here. These students on this side are going to be next to the light and the students all the way in here are not necessarily going to have that. And I think a really easy way to solve that is if there was just a, a nice, elegant light well that allowed perimeter windows on both sides of that space to really allow light to come in and come in from both sides, it could really make this a really wonderful experience. And it would tell me right away that light is the heart of my building, you know, as opposed, as opposed to just dealing with the perimeter. And that would make two narrow pieces with a light port in the center rather than one deep space that's gonna, I think, be kind of dark in the center honestly, because it's going to be so much brighter on this perimeter, it's even going to make it feel a bit more dark by contrast. Um, so I, I think the same thing could happen over here in a really powerful way. You have this uh, two-story space of a library, and if there's any space in this entire building where I want to bring some light in from above, it's above this two-story space. You do have a courtyard up there now. You could expand that courtyard and drop a skylight in that courtyard at the second floor. So when you're out on that terrace, the skylight is actually an element that you touch and you know that the skylight is critical because you actually experience it's not just something that disappears above your head. And you could drop beautiful light. You know, again, this is a deep space. If you could drop light right over top of these stairs coming all the way from above, then all of a sudden the entire interior would feel like just some brighter and more friendly. And so I think just it, it's the same principle when it's really deep, just bring some light into the middle. And that almost gives you a null secondary set of perimeters that allow light to come in. Right. Yeah, but, um, as you mentioned, we're the library. Uh, my idea was here to use these angle apertures that it would uh, expand or diffuse the lighting towards uh, the, the interior of the library and as well that's why that's why I also thought about opening this have this big opening on the stairs just to introduce more lighting inside of the first floor another idea I had why not have this opening stairs I don't I know it's not as clear right now but open stairs so the light would also go through the treads of the stairs and I do agree that on the studios right here, uh, this area could be the darkest. Um, I thought uh, about adding a skylight over here on the third floor. But yeah, I do agree here that it could be the darkest. But um, uh, since this, I took this also, as you mentioned, as the heart of uh, the heart, uh, this area, because I wanted to have this gathering spot for the studio. Uh, here is where uh, there is a kitchenette for the studios. Uh, here is just uh, sitting uh, with a sh bookshelves right here. So yeah, I do, I do think that this area, because of being the gathering, the main gathering spot of the studio, could have more lighting introduced. So in listening to comments and uh, some thoughts of my own, I, I think that emotionally that you've demonstrated some interesting. Um, ideas about what you like about light, how light can come into spaces. And then you, you, you thought maybe that you had to make a building that somehow embodied all these things. But 
what I think you're lacking, and it took me a while, number one, to see your North Arrow. I don't even know how the sun works across, except it's in my face right now. Um, how, how light works on the site and how does the path of the sun influence some of the things that you're suggesting. Um, you have now digital programs that will show you how light will work in spaces. Right. With, with physical rooms, with aperture sizes, you have this at your disposal. And it would seem that that would have been maybe a better place to spend your time about light, if it's a thesis about light mm -hmm. and how I can make better spaces and how I can utilize sunlight in better ways. I can put trays in, you know, I can, I can reflect light. We can do all kinds of things now. Maybe that's what your thesis needed to be, not necessarily making an architecture school. I mean, maybe it went too far, right? With with the building side of it, because you left a, a lot out. That's that's my feeling. Uh, one more thing. I wanted to talk just for a few moments about the facade. Um, so when you have these long sort of slots of light, that's starting to create like almost a filtered quality that's kind of like minimizing and maximizing. Mm -hmm. But I think to make it like more rich relative to your intentions, I think on some of these sort of larger expanses of glass, you could introduce just a really delicate filigree pattern that's almost like a perforated metal or something that would soften and filter the light rather than having like a, in this one drawing at the, 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 the main drawing at the beginning, you know, it's pretty high contrast. But you could, um, you know, like all the beautiful screen walls of Islamic architecture and even of some modern architecture, you could start to, to address some of the harshness of light by just creating an architectural element or form that then would also reinforce your thesis and talk about, you know, the, the nature of the craft of pieces as well. So. Thank you. Just to kind of piggyback on the facade comments, um, I think one thing that might have uh, led people to think that this might have been an existing building is the use of brick. And I was thinking like, oh, if you really could choose any finish in the world <laughs> to uh, depict a thesis, a building that's about light, would you use brick? And I, I don't think I would. And I think I would veer more towards like type of screening or very like framing um, elements of a facade and not something that is so monolithic and heavy. Uh, just, yeah, just the kind of first impression when I look at the building from a distance. And I know you when, when you design kind of from the inside out, that can happen kind of easily, um, but you should always kind of be going back and forth from interior to exterior to really develop the building as a whole. Um, I think one thing that would help graphically kind of speak to the, um, because your, your building's about time lapse too, because we do spend sometimes multiple days in this building. It's gonna be the same diagram at different times of day if it's not a GIF or something that's moving a video or something that would show the um, path of the sun actually changing your, like, right. you know, like the areas that are glowing, they're not always glowing all the time at that place at the same time. So I think, it would be beneficial to show kind of what the morning would look like and what the, you know, midday, just really basic, but it does kind of um, provide a clear narrative on how you thought of these spaces were gonna work in relation to the position of the sun. I think your library is situated in prime in a prime spot. And yeah, it could have benefited a little bit more from maybe using monitors or something coming like really grand um, at the roof to let in more light there. I, I agree with those comments and same with that other, um, you know, bringing in a light well or several light wells to kind of break up a deep floor plate uh, just because you are, you know, there are site constraints, so I understand. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm curious about the choice of materials on the exterior, maybe you can speak so, to that. Yes, um, so the idea I had there was I wanted I didn't want it to introduce just, I don't know, where a new building into the UMD campus. I wanted to continue with the same culture that we had throughout the campus. So I didn't want to 
um, provide a new material to it. I just wanted to continue with the same uh, culture, the same materials that we have in the campus. So that was the idea I have there. And what does the glare represent in terms of material? What was that? What does the glare represent in terms of material? The red? The gray. The gray. Oh, that's concrete. Concrete. Um, to piggyback off of the second to last comment, I'm, I think one thing that you're also missing is not just like temporality during the day, but temporality during the seasons, mm -hmm. um, because the light will, you know, come in at different angles right. um, pretty significantly. Um, and everything has been rendered, I don't know, like 4 p.m. or like 3 p.m. on July, I don't know. So like really do think about how light moves throughout the year, how light moves throughout the day. Um, I'm also really curious to see how light will infiltrate this building at night, even if it's just the ambient light from like street lights and things of that nature, because people are in here not just during the day. You guys are here all night long too. So, I mean, you shouldn't bake, but go to sleep. Um, yeah. And so thinking about the light quality throughout the occupation, this is truly one of the few buildings on campus that is used almost 24 7. 24 7, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I do agree. I think that uh, having those videos just to, show the lighting throughout the day will be helpful, which is, um, I mean, I don't want to say it was uh, because of time issue, but I guess I do agree that that could also reinforce more of my design. Yeah, I mean, I think this thesis is something that you can carry well into your career as sort of like a subject of interest for you to explore um, once you graduate. And I would continue to push the ideas, especially some of these moments and these sketches and in the models, which are very beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, my only other piece of advice, and someone else told this to me one time, like within every building, don't throw the kitchen sink at it. Like find your moments and then like, like really amplify those moments. And then sometimes you have to edit out those other things and use those in your next project. But um, creating, I think a little bit more hierarchy within the space and then allowing other things to kind of take like a design diet and calm down a little bit. And then those things that are really special will be super special in that building. Okay. One of those things that I would maybe reconsider is your structural axon, because it's kind of just taking up space. And I don't know if you'd actually even do it that way, um, just based on your whole design. So I would really, I think what you did well is highlight you know, your thesis is about lighting. Let's just talk about that. That's a really good way to kind of edit down. Um, and then also going back to just how dynamic light can be, you kind of want your building to move and adapt with it. And so I would expect to see maybe another, you know, level of design would be to introduce like more oper operation and operable louvers or big you know huge shutters or stuff that you can maybe see and read from the exterior that are impacting the interior okay right so i have two questions that have nothing to do with light okay. so uh just show me exactly where the front door is like i'm looking there's all these sidewalks that kind kind of converge here in the plan like the first floor entry which can be more visible right here. So I designed the that landscape in a way just to uh, create this promenade to uh, introduce you to the main entry, which is in this area. Yeah, it's kind of a shame in this drawing that there's a tree kind of covering that, because I do think the entry is important. And I, the sign might sort of tell me to walk towards the entry because there's a, a large signage here and the sidewalks may guide me there. But I want the building form itself also to tell me where the entrance is. And then just in terms of pure formality of elements, um, you know, when I look at this facade and, you know, I'm okay with brick, but I might do white brick in this case, <laughs> just because of the nature of the project. But I look at this sort of large plane here that's kind of undefined. And, and then there's this little thing here. Like, I, I, I don't understand in this, if, is this a solid building that has openings cut into it? Or, or is it a series of planes? Like I almost wish this just went all the way up and this was just metal panel here. So we didn't have this kind of little minimal piece of brick that's kind of very sort of almost barely attached to this more massive piece. I think if it was done as a series of vertical elements, it might reinforce what's happening here. And it would be a little bit more clear that these are planes and not like a volumetric form. 
So, you know, think about those, those little things in terms of, you know, volume or skin, you know, yes, when, you, when you design facades. That wall right there, it's the outdoors of this uh, space over here. So this, that big wall that you see here, I, I decided to just leave it solid just because uh, I thought about it can be useful for presentation boards in this area and then have those uh, vertical lighting uh, going on the side on an angle just so it could introduce this lighting, but at the same time, not uh, be direct to the students or the professors or the presentation that is happening in. All right, Christy. Um, nicely done. This was a very ambitious and bold project, obviously, given the given the nature of it, and given everybody's feelings about this building we're, we're having these debates right now and you're you're thank god you're not privy to them you don't have to worry about the kinds of debates we're having behind closed doors about how we want our next building to be but um i just want to draw a couple of, uh, draw attention to a couple of things that christy didn't have time to tell you about uh, uh, concerning her process and um uh, she was deeply engaged with understanding how light works on this site and she even went outside on the winter solstice, um, the shortest day of the year to understand and, and analyze over the course of the day how light worked on this very site. Uh, she did do those time-lapse analyses of light through each one of these spaces. And just to take an example of how nicely it actually works, the lecture hall and the way that those uh, slats in the wall work in the lecture hall, they cast beams of light that go across your feet in the aisles and never shine in your face. Uh, and they keep that lecture hall wall free of light. And uh, she, she also did a lot of research on psychological studies of different, different forms of light in spaces, whether they're pointing away from you towards the walls, whether they're pointing along the wall towards the ground, or whether they're illuminating the whole space and how those activate different psychological uh, experiences. I think most fundamentally, Christy, the, mo the most provocative and interesting thing about your th uh, thesis idea is a kind of radical thinking about how an educational instructional space uses light. Because I think the paradigm right now on campuses everywhere is a lot of light almost just light suffusing the whole building. It's almost as if uh, learning is a matter of shining light on worker ants so that they go. Uh, you have a kind of much more poetic idea of how light can define space and create patterns in space. You control light, you have areas of privacy, and you even said it yourself, and you said it to me many times, you want the school to feel like a second home there's really something to that in this um, this post-COVID era. Uh, a lot of people would rather go to, would rather stay home to do work and to do schoolwork and not come to the institutions for it because home is more comfortable. And these uh, just pervasively lit spaces feel much more institutional and cold. So I think you kind of have something there. Uh, but I really profoundly agree with the comment that there's a big jump from your charcoal drawings and your studies along those lines to the actual form of the building. Maybe too much reliance on Revit, too much of this kind of pancake, let's just make the, is that automatically we're gonna have a stack of uh, floor plates. You could have really actually had the form of the bu building follow your original vision more. Uh, and I think there's some ways to go with that, but, um, uh, but you should be commended for that uh, pretty provocative vision. Thank you, Professor. That one looks too annoying. Good job.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay, we're going to gather for the final presentation. Jurors to the front. I think maybe all the jurors are actually here. All right, I'm going to hand it over to our final presenter of the day. Thank you. So I just saw it. Yeah, testing. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Samanti Habib, and this is Stop Wasting Cairo. This thesis is proposing a cleaner and safer way to handle the waste while still heavily involving the Zebulin through a multifunctional waste to energy facility. Egypt is really known for its rich historical backgrounds like the pyramids, the Sphinx, the Nile River, and much more. Although what people really don't know is the amount of waste that's currently being produced in Egypt. Egypt is bordered by the Mediterranean Sea and the Red Sea, and some adjacent countries are Libya, Sudan, and Saudi Arabia. This thesis is specifically located in Cairo, the capital of Egypt, and the Nile River run, runs right through Egypt and Cairo. As of today, Egypt's population has reached 112 million people, and it's estimated to be 200 million by the year of 2080. After Nigeria and Ethiopia, Egypt is the most populated country on the African continent. Within Egypt, there is the overall Greater Cairo boundary, and within that boundary falls multiple districts. And I want to specifically point out Manshayat Nasser, which is now being referred to as the garbage city, and all the Zebelines currently live there. The Zebelines translate to the garbage people. Cairo's demographics as of today, in the year 2000, it was less than 10 million people. So I wanna emphasize their uh, current population has reached 22.2 million. So it's nearly doubled over the past 10, I guess 23 years, I should say. Um, and by the year 2030, it should reach up to 25.5 million. Um, and it's constantly growing at a 1.99% rate, and 90% of its population currently practice the Muslim religion, although 10% of it practice Christianity or they're Coptic Christians and the Zebelines, again, the trash people, they currently fall under those 10%. So what really, again, is the problem here? Egypt currently produces 90 million tons of solid waste per day at a rate of 55,000 tons per day. And Cairo alone produces 15,000 tons of waste. So I just threw a whole bunch of numbers at you, right? Let's compare it to a well-known city here, New York. In New York, an average person produces three pounds, while a person in Cairo produced 2.42 pounds of waste. The main difference is the population between the two. There are different types of municipal solid waste in Cairo. 55% of it is organic waste, 2.5% is glass, 14% is paper or cardboard, 16.4% is plastics, and the 12 is considered others. So what does this all mean? Is Cairo really drowning in waste as of today? The answer is no. Um, on the outside skirts of Cairo, lies the district Menshayat Nasser, which again is now being referred to as the garbage city. And within Menshayat Nasser, all of the current residents, um, again, the Zebelines, they now have a huge role in the waste management process and they are their main source of waste management. They are the only people who pick up the trash and bring it back to their district. The government has tried to kind of find a solution for all of this waste, but none of the private sectors that they have paid um, worked out. So now currently the Zebelines are the only uh, resource system in, in all of Cairo. So how did the Zebelines come to be? And it all started in 1900 when a group called the Wahali Group migrated from the Dakahala Oasis in Egypt's Western desert, desert region, and they settled in downtown Cairo. But 30 years later is when the Zebelines came to Cairo from Asyut in southern Egypt. Both groups started working together about 10 years later, but the Zebelines found a way to make a living from the waste. They would use that 55% that was organic waste and they would feed their pigs. They would then sell the pigs to local tourists. Um, in 1989, 
uh, an agreement between the two groups, the Wahali group and the Zebelines, resulted in them buying new trash trucks. So originally they were using donkey carts to pick up all the waste, and obviously that wasn't efficient at all. Um, but there was absolutely no governmental assistance. They used all their personal savings in order to purchase these trucks. Uh, about a decade later in 2000, the Zebelines have now created what is arguably one of the world's most efficient resource recovery and recycling system. In 2009, just to, this is kind of like a fun fact. Um, in 2009, when the swine flu pandemic hit, um, the government went around and started killing all the pigs. So it affected the Zebelines' main source of income. Uh, but then they realized that the pigs were not really the main cause of the swine flu pandemic, uh, but it really um, represented a religious bias against the Muslim majority. So the overall proposal of this thesis is to continue to keep the Zebelines engaged within the thesis, have them continue to collect the waste, but instead of bringing it back to Manchayat Nasser, which is, again, the garbage city, they will now bring it to this new facility where all the sorting can still be done. The organic waste will still be used to feed their pigs, so their income will not be affected, and any left, any waste that's left over will then go through the waste to energy facility. Keeping in mind that this facility will not bring more toxins and harsh chemicals and it won't pollute um, Cairo because a lot of that is being controlled within the facility. So the overall selected site, the site is about a 15 minute drive from Manshayat Nasser. Um, in relationship to Cairo, Cairo is right on the Nile River. Um, so from, from Cairo, it's like a 15 miles. Um, and then moving forward, the site is about 13.8 acres large. And again, it's only a 15 minute drive from Manshayat Nasser. So instead of bringing all of the waste into the city, they would now bring it down to the site. So just to summarize everything about Manchayat Nasser, again, it's a district of Greater Cairo. There's over 270,000 people. Um, it ranges, it's like on an average, uh, females, males, there's families, there's young children. And other than the uh, income that they receive from their pigs, they also receive 56 cents to collect trash from apartments per day. But this is US currency, so this is something to keep in mind. When this gets translated to Egyptian pounds, uh, each pig makes about 80 to 100 on average, so that translates to 2,500 Egyptian pounds. So to them, that's still a really good amount of money. Okay, it's a graphic warning. This video is not pleasant to the eye, but here's kind of some of the characteristics that are happening within Manchayat Nasser. Once home, the women and girls do almost all the sorting. It takes 10 to 12 hours a day, even when everyone pitches in. The Zabalin tend to have big families, since they need lots of extra hands. Initially, the garbage gets separated into general categories. Paper, plastic, cardboard, and metal and then resorted into astonishingly specific piles. You can tell a lot about a city from its garbage. Since they don't wear gloves, tetanus is a constant threat. And nearly half of the Zabalin test positive for hepatitis. Given their environment and poor hygiene, they get sick a lot. All organic waste is fed to pigs. This is why the Coptic Christians have a monopoly on trash collection. Egypt's 80 million Muslims don't eat pork. Pigs are the Zabalin's main source of income. All right, so after watching that, again, not very pleasant to the eye, but something to keep in mind is Manchayat Nasser, the garbage city, still has a lot of the same characteristics that any district or city would currently have today, which includes schools, mosques, 
apartment complexes, like people are really living within the waste today. So this chosen site, again, in relation to Manchayat Nasser, which is up there in the corner, um, the site is bordered by three main roads. This main road right here, Al Makatam Road is the main road to access the site, but some of the surrounding context include fast food places, uh, photography studios, there's a very large underground cave church that's under all of this topography. Uh, there's a couple green spaces in the uptown Cairo region, and then also uh, mosques as well as commercial stores, but one thing to note is the facility is isolated from any residential buildings, uh, just because of all the overall smells and toxins. Oops. Uh, the site's also very accessible by bus, car, and metro. The closest bus stop is about a half mile away. So the Zebelines have really identified a niche in Cairo's infrastructure to capitalize on. And as a family effort, they all collect, transport, sort, and dispose of waste inefficiently by hand. Family members are exposed to harmful waste, bacteria, and possible injury in order to make a living. The new facility takes danger out of the equation and members would continue collecting and transporting the waste, but now they will transport it to their new facility where waste can be sorted and disposed of efficiently and safely while still remaining their profit. Here's an overall representation of that new sorting facility that I'll also point out on the site plan, but as you can see, it's just a much more cleaner and safer environment. So on the site plan, um, locating just some of the zones, I'm gonna use this to point. Uh, right here is that sorting facility, which you just saw a visual of. Here is the waste to energy facility and how it's being intersected by the public program. And then there are three main parking lots. This one over here is designated to the trash trucks for overnight parking. This one's closer to the classrooms, which I'll go into. So it's for school buses. And this one's for visitors. Um, and workers as well. But again, here is that El Mekatem road that leads everyone onto the site. And these roads were really designated for the trash trucks to flow through the facility and whatever waste they aren't using will then run through the waste to energy facility. So looking deeper into the program, it was divided into four categories, starting with the waste to energy facility, the second being the education about waste, third, environmental education, and the fourth, the sorting of valuable waste. The education about waste is going to be used a better way to reduce, reuse, and recycle the waste and have visitors really be educated on how much Cairo is currently producing and how efficient and how uh, waste can benefit them overall. And then for environmental education, it's going to be used to educate citizens on composting and agriculture. And the sorting of valuable waste will be used for the Zebelines to have a cleaner and much more efficient environment to work in. So all these four programs are laid out in the overall massing. Uh, the building overall is just a two-story design that intersects the waste to energy facility with educational program. So while the visitors are flowing through the space, they also get a sense of the flow of waste as well. Using this again. So looking on the ground floor, there's mainly all of the public program along with the waste to energy facility program. And we can see starting with the side here, it's really where the exhibit viewing is. So you get a view of the tipping hall and then the waste bunker space. So as people are moving through the space, they get a sense of how the trucks come in, tip over and dump their waste into the waste bunker space. And this is where all the waste gets sorted out. As they're entering in through the space, there's a very large exhibit walk that they flow through, and it's broken up into three portions. The first one being a historical portion, um, just going back to all of the history of Cairo and how the Zebelines came to be. The second portion being a factual um, portion throughout the exhibit walk, and it gives people the idea of how much waste is currently being produced. And then the education portion, again, will just have like a hands-on activity with these classrooms that are being envisioned to be a very large open space. Um, so it's like an indoor-outdoor feel between the two. And it allows for visitors and students to get a hands-on activity of agriculture and composting. And then here, again, is that sorting facility for the trash trucks. And any waste, mainly anything other than organic, really, would then come back through the facility and go through the waste to energy uh, process. 
And here's an overall representation of that exhibit walk. And we are located right up here. So you get the view of the tipping hall. And as you work your way down, you have a view of the waste bunker space as well. The second floor is mainly designed using an observation deck. And the observation deck is located right up against the waste bunker space. So people get a view of the upper portion so they can really see the crane in action as it's coming down and sorting through the space or through the waste. Um, so that's the main difference between the first and the second floor. And here is an overall representation of that observation deck. So for the facades and the type of material that was used um, was really specific to Kairos. It starts with, there were three main materials, a limestone brick, a metal panel skin, and glazing. And the limestone brick was chosen because of how common, how commonly used it is today in Cairo. All their residential and commercial buildings are made from limestone brick. Um, and the limestone brick continues up 15 feet tall, uh, just to match the overall surrounding context. And that brick uh, wraps around the entire facility. These two main uh, sections, the first one, the west-east section is cutting through some of the waste to energy facility program along with uh, some of the public programs. So you have the tipping hall and then the exhibit walk. So you can see the relationship between those two. And then the north-south section cutting through the um, mainly the public program, starting with the offices for the workers, uh, the atrium space, and then the entire exhibit walk that then leads you to the classroom spaces. So looking quickly again on the ground floor, here is an overall representation of the exhibit view. So it again starts off with a historical background of Cairo and the Zebelines, and then it goes into a much more factual information um, all up along the panels. And then it leads you into the educational portion, which it gives people an idea of composting and agriculture and how they can use waste to their benefit. So the overall goals of this thesis was really to provide a space of recreation, educate the citizens, propose a new way of viewing waste, and have a cleaner and safer waste management process for not only Cairo, but for the Zebelines as well. And that concludes the presentation. I look forward to any comments, questions, and feedback. Thank you. Yes. Is it on now? Yeah. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Samantha. Very interesting. <laughs> it's just, wow. Um, is, in your programming for the project, did you include anything like, you know, the Ze stuff for the Zebeline people? Like, the, do they get showers and lockers and, yes. and accommodations for them, hygiene issues and things like that? Yes. So on the ground floor in the sorting facility, um, there are bathrooms, showers, and break rooms for them. And how do they get there? So they drive the trucks in? No. <laughs> no. So there's like these alleys. Um, it starts with these are dumpsters. The people work in between, and these are like conveyor belts. And then the the, the roads go through the um, the sorting facility. But kind of once it's like the end of the day and they're done working is when they would go to the break rooms, showers, bathrooms, whatever is needed for them. But are, are those people, are they coming there on foot? No, these are the Zebelines working. So once so they're they working the there, but but where's their community and how do they get there? Yeah, thank you. How do the workers get to work? Use the stick. <laughs> Use the stick. How do, like if I'm a member of my Zebeline group, how do I get there? Do I do I take a bus? Yeah, so there's, there's different transportation. Um, there's a bus stop that's half a mile away. Um, it's accessible by cars and metro as well, but this is the main road that's accessible. And I mean, whether you're a visitor, you come down here, whether you are uh, a Zebeline working and you're coming in with the trash trucks, you would come in through here. Is that But do they come in in cars or buses or, and do you, I guess the question is, do you have to keep them separate from the public? Because if they have all these health issues and mm -hmm. public hygiene issues, do they have to remain, is there a separate cir secure circulation from them compared to the people who come visit the joint? Yeah, so they are kind of isolated in this sorting facility. They don't really get access into here. Um, so this is where the main 
public program is, the waste energy facility, and then the sorting facility. So all of the Zebelines work in this facility. They don't really have an association. Or something that they... Within the break room, um, it was designed to have like a kitchen area as well. Okay. And how many of them are there working at a time, would you think? So... I mean, the entire population is over 270,000 people in so the district. So less than that. But way less than that. <laughs> way less than that. Um, on average, it's about like 10 to 15 people working a day that go into Cairo, grab all the trash, and bring it back to But they're area. not driving the trucks, or they are driving they the trucks? They the are trucks. driving yes. the trucks. Yes. Yes. Okay. So mm -hmm. No, so these are for these are for, for the visitors, um, and these are school bus. Yeah. So it's just completely isolated from one another. I would consider this kind of more of like the back end, back of house, and this is more of like a frontal view for the visitors. I think there was a question back here. On a very difficult problem that actually has a really long history. Mm -hmm. So when I worked for an NGO in Cairo in the mid '80s, um, this was already a very well uh, studied problem. Mm -hmm. um, Zebaline picked up my trash, picked up all of our trash, and um, I think the there's just a few points I want to make. These are not just a bunch of families carting gar garbage. At that time, it was already a very, very lucrative ring that was almost organized in a mafia-like way with very mm. wealthy people at the top. Mm -hmm. And um, the other thing is that they did not sell pigs to tourists, right? <laughs> that did yes. not happen. <laughs> there were discreet butcher shops and specialty charcuterie shops. Obviously, Cairo had a huge uh, westernized and also European mm -hmm. population until the Nasser regime. So there's a whole business network set up around the pork product. So that's really important but the reason the main thing I want to ask you is even then I remember that there were a lot of anthropological studies that were done and I'm sure a lot of precedents for sort of improving how can one intervene in these very complex nodes that that uh, are based on extreme inequalities so did you look at any of those precedents one of the main precedents I studied was Biggs uh, waste to energy facility in Denmark. And I was really looking at the way and how they incorporated public and educational program throughout a waste to energy facility. Because at first I was like, how do you incorporate such a public program with a facility that produces waste? And how can some of those smells be um, kind of like incorporated within the facility, but also just separated from um, the public portion, but I found that it was doable. So that was one of the main precedents I looked at. And they also included a lot of environmental um, program to uh, their facility as well. That might not work specifically for Cairo just because we're in the desert, but they did have like a sloping roof and things like that. So we incorporated zero scaping throughout the entire facility just around it to create um, some shading um, and still bring a sense of greenery to the facility. But that was just one of the main um, overall precedence that I studied in the beginning. Yeah. I mean, I commend you for using waste to energy. It's a system that we in America haven't built in like 20 years. Yeah. Um, I've actually done a lot of work on waste to energy. I'm not sure if you read Hanif Kara's book on uh, replanned obsolescence. Mm -hmm. It's all about waste to energy proposals. I um, actually submitted one that was in that book, so you should buy it. It's only $25 on Amazon. <laughs> um, no, looking no. specifically at your waste to energy, you're, are you talking about using this for the entire city of Cairo? This plant? No. <laughs> no, so you'd have others around? So um, that's a, actually a great question because we've been tackling it as well. This would be more of a prototype okay. um, just because Cairo's population is huge. Yeah. And there's so much uh, waste being produced on a daily 15 million tons. So I know that this facility itself won't be able to handle all of the waste, yeah. but I'm hoping that it'll be a start for them. And okay. so they can see um, that this is possible. This is something that can be done and it can be, there can be multiple facilities throughout, okay. throughout Cairo. Yeah. So, I mean, one thing I was going to say, if it was intended to be for all of Cairo, it's like way undersized. Oh, yeah. Like a facility <laughs> like this is really going to be eligible for like maybe a million or two million people, probably right. no more than that. Right. Um, and so I think one thing to think about, um, and I'm glad you looked at Biggs. There are other precedents that might be a little bit better, but um, 
and looking at your actual like waste to energy cycle that you have going on here, you have one key thing that you haven't actually leveraged, which is um, the heat that's being gained outside of um, in cooling. So, you know, you have the wind turbine, mm -hmm. you have the water that's inserted in that to then cool and then it goes into water vapor, which is what they did. Um, and they do that in the American model. But what they did do in big and what they do in other European models is that that hot water, instead of being coming water vapor that's being released into the air, mm -hmm. which probably isn't really great in an already hot environment is to then reuse that water elsewhere. So you're talking about massive amounts of hot water, right. which can then be going into um, district heating systems. It can possibly go into portable water um, for, for showering and, and washing and cooking purposes. And so that's a huge sort of benefit of waste energy that I don't think you're fully harnessing right now. Uh, you also are saying you're going to take your, your fly ash to landfill you can use fly ash as part of your construction methods. Um, you get about 3% of the waste that's been incinerated becomes fly ash, and that can go into concrete as an additive. Um, there's a whole bunch of different things you can use in terms of building materialities or other sorts of systems. And so I think like really using this thing, which is extraordinarily powerful and isn't really well uh, used across the world, and then like really pushing it in terms of its efficiency. Um, it is also, have you been to one before? I have not. <laughs> they are stinky as God knows what. So um, I, I appreciate sort of the separation between the educational facilities and everything else, um, but just really thinking about the smell, um, yeah. especially being in proximity to the road. A lot of times they're pushed several hundred feet back, mm. if not like, you know, half a mile, half a, half a meter, um, what am I trying to say? Uh, half a, yeah, you know, 300 meters back, just so that they don't, you know, encroach in terms of the smell. I really appreciate the water comment because it's also a question that we have been kind of tackling um, just because Egypt is known as like a subtropical desert and yeah. they get like two inches of rain a year. Yeah. So I really appreciate that. Yeah. Comment. I mean, it's good to know. I mean, the other thing is you could like capture that water and like let it circulate around somewhere else around the site for a little bit and then use it as cool, cooling water somewhere else. But I wouldn't just let that, that vapor go into the air right. and it's a waste. A question back here. Thanks, Menti. Um, I appreciate that um, Dana is opening up the conversation here to um, the resources that come out of the process, mm -hmm. talking about heat. And my thought also went to the ash, uh, considering there's a tremendous amount of it. Um, you know, if we look at the uh, conventional landfill. I think in the last 30 or 40 years, the transformation of landfills into parks has been one of the most significant transformations of, of um, uh, waste in the public realm, right? Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to a landfill that's become a park, but it's a really powerful experience to, it's a spatial experience, it's an immersive experience where you get a sense of scale of how much waste we produced in right. uh, capitalist systems like our own, right? It yeah. kind of it kind of awakens you in a way that looking at charts and pie graphs really don't, right? right? So I think you started your presentation today by trying to give us a sense of scale, the enormity of scale, yeah. right? And I think that your exhibit walk might be only one small way of starting to describe the sense of scale of waste to the public. Mm. And then in fact, you could start to create landscapes of ash and terrain and topography and ex outdoor experiences beyond the walls of this building or uh, uh, infiltrating the building or surrounding the building or something else. Mm -hmm. Some other ways of creating spatial experiential um, methods that allow people to grapple with a sense of scale because it's nearly impossible to wrap our minds around it. Right. Um, and it's one of the challenges I think it, we, we need to um, you know, awaken to the enormity of the problem. And one of the ways to do that is to create space. Thank you. Um, well, one of the, what's that? <laughs> I'm just going to follow up on Michael's comment real quick. One of the other ways you could do that would be in the exhibition design as well, you know, to, to show that, yeah. which I think you were starting to do. Yeah. But I'm told I have to hand the microphone to somebody <laughs> here. Sorry. So please. There's a lot of topography in the area. So that's also good to note. Thank you. Sorry, go ahead. Just looking at your program, it's really interesting and unique. And I 
I don't have experience with the waste energy. So that's also very interesting. And I like when you kind of <laughs> show your, or um, celebrate a technology and an, an infrastructure and amenity for uh, at least a segment of the city. And I, I think it's a great example. I think one thing programmatically that kind of going back to, um, you know, the questions about what do the, is it the Zabalin? Yes. What do they, like, where are they? What are they doing? Um, what do they get out of this? Yeah. Um, I, I think it's good that we're, you're addressing this problem of sanitation and safety, but it looks like you could take it a little further by, you know, providing like, a, I don't know, more health services or some other component that is not like, you know, the exhi exhibition space and mm -hmm. classrooms take up a lot of space relative to what they, what the workers get. And I just feel like this, you know, the balance needs to kind of go a little more in their favor um, and a little more, you know, if you're going to highlight them in the exhibition, mm -hmm. they should get like something to more tangible out of this. Yeah. Thank you. I was literally going to say the same thing. So, um, when the question kind of came up of where are they and they're saying like they have no connection between the two buildings, it's almost like you're, um, I don't want it to be um, kind of thought of as trying to lure only 10 people to kind of come here because I think you said it's only about 10 people. Yeah. Um, but in your presentation, you kind of talked about how it's a whole city and family kind of business now. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you kind of start to think through um, more of the the context of, and of people and um, make sure that when you're designing, it's not for just outside education, because I think there's a lot of kind of studies on this already. So people are already are kind of aware of it. But how are you actually benefiting the people that's there um, and improving their way of life because you kind of mentioned that that's something that you're interested in mm -hmm. but this site, this site seems to kind of be reversed in that of kind of just educating more instead of necessarily addressing kind of the key um, the key problem of just health so mm -hmm. I totally agree with you on terms of like how do you kind of bring in space for for improving some of their health conditions as well um outside of that i find your presentation to be quite compelling i even like your use of little bits of garbage kind of planted in between i think it's very thoughtful of kind of just bringing you into the space and thinking about um the topic at hand and it's a big <laughs> a big one to tackle um so i I appreciate the, the creativity you. for sure. Thank you. And I definitely agree with the um, comment about the Zebelines. Um, It was funny because Professor Ronit, I don't know if she's here, but it was kind of her idea after our presentation to include this sorting facility, which I thought was a great idea. So I think moving forward, if I were to add more um, just for like health concerns and sanitation concerns, um, it definitely would be a part of my next phase or iteration of this. Thank you. I think there was a question back there or whoever. I had a lot of good input about technical president precedents and landfill parks and so forth. And I think Mohammed has a comment he wants to make about that. When I was talking about precedents, I was talking about precedents meaning anthropological studies mm. and spatial studies that look at their lives, right? Mm. The people's lives and routes and so forth. Because, I mean, you know, again, I have been away from this for a very long time, but the idea of a large center located somewhere, it's hard to understand how that's related to what people are already doing. And I could imagine maybe some kind of urban acupuncture approach where you're actually figuring out where these different nodes are and doing kind of mobile centers that try to upgrade those situations. Because if there are these powerful interests sort of controlling the Zebalin anyway, they're only going to be enriched by this right. kind of thing. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's such a relevant topic and such an important one. So, um, and especially, you know, if you are there, it's it's a very familiar scene. So that's why 
I may respectfully disagree with uh, my friend's comment, with Michael's comment on on creating a pile of trash or garbage in order to make a message because mm -hmm. it's it's everywhere in right. Cairo, right? right? So you see it everywhere. You don't need to create one in order to send a message. The other thing is, um, I'm sure that in your studies, probably you came up uh, across uh, Al-Azhar Park, right? That was created, I mean, partly on, on one of these I mean, huge piles of trash um, at, at some point, probably about... Okay. And it also had to do with this notion of hygiene and public health and this kind of garbage issue in right. the in the city of Cairo. And I also want to go back to what what you mentioned, um, uh, Michel here, that let's not sugarcoat it that the Zabalin are our mafia. I mean, it's a it's a mafia yeah. across Middle East. And I know that there are some families who are involved in this business, but I, I mean, what, what I see as a future of your project is that there is going to be a huge resistance coming from this mafia that you have to deal with, mm. right? And I mean, this is a fabulous project. I really commend you, but Thank we you. always kind of need to think about, you know, what's going to happen because... Uh, I mean, I think the complexity of architecture is that we try to come up with beautiful, amazing ideas, but then there are con some consequences. Some, I mean, thing, I mean, some, um, some um, uh, side effects of architecture, right? Like, for example, mafia that is, I mean, that has some self-interest that we have not thought about, right? So right. We, we need to think about uh, who is going to be affected and how their interest is going to be affected. It's good to know because I read an article, I think it was like an American citizen just in Cairo and they visited um, their district and they got beaten up for taking photos of the garbage. So it seems like they don't want anyone to just mess with um, their garbage or their district, but this really was just a way to help them, I guess, or just improve some of those sanitation. Please. So there's some, some of those sanitation and hygiene issues in Cairo as well. Um, I, I think this is a fascinating project. This Thank is so, so certainly something we should all know more about. Um, I don't even, I, I think we only scratched the surface. Look at all the architecture that you <laughs> produced here. We didn't even talk about buildings. <laughs> we looked at your plans. I'm going to take take your word for it, they work. Look at your buildings. These, these are a wonderful, you know, ener energy building structure that you've uh, proposed here. I assume that there are some uh, materials which are um, native mm -hmm. to Cairo. There's some patterns and designs that I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is amazing. It's Thank you. very well done. Thank you. Uh, Thank incredible you very depth. Much. Thank you. Thank you. What are the <laughs> yes, there are. <laughs> uh, there's the limestone brick that's used because it's currently used in all of Cairo today for their commercial and residential buildings. But I'm also adding like a modern twist and bringing in metal, like a metal skin uh, or a metal panel skin around the upper portion. Uh, but the limestone brick stops at 15 feet high uh, just to match the overall surrounding context. And there's glazing. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so I'm glad you brought that up because... Uh... I was just thinking, well, let's talk about the architecture because, you know, there is a lot of really good stuff here. Thank you. I mean, first thing is it looks like a factory. <laughs> the material selections, the mm -hmm. proportions, the scale, the volumes, the roof lines, I mean, it all looks totally like what I would expect a factory to look like. And so as a building, you know, with the, the random kind of pieces, it looks like it could be, you know, any number of types of facilities, you know, processing whatever, coal or right. trash or whatever. Um, the thing I would try to to develop a little bit further in this, mm -hmm. both the, the vehicular and the pedestrian circulation, okay. both both look like underdeveloped to me. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll give you a sense as someone who's designed several bus stations, like, you know, this feels really, really inefficient. 
Okay. And, and you almost don't even need that whole thing. You know, why not just park the buses right along here? Mm -hmm. So they come in, they go around the circle, they park on edges, mm -hmm. and then everyone comes through this one walk. You know, is it really nice? You know, and, and even the walks, like you have this one, which I think is a great thing, mm -hmm. but then it kind of just ends weirdly at this kink. Like, like that feels like it doesn't resolve itself. Right. And you have this one, this one coming from the street and this one coming in, but then they all kind of like sort of stop and don't connect. Like, I, I just want a hub here, like a terrace or something right. that unites all this stuff and brings people into the building and just, just a little more cleanness and a little more efficiency. Like even in this parking, you know, you don't have to have like, what is this doing? It's doing nothing. You, you know, this could be right up against that edge. Mm. You know, this whole thing, there could just be a lot less paving. You drive right. a long way to get to the parking. You know, why isn't it like right in the middle? You know, where maybe there's just one line to it. So I, I would just like tighten up the circulation because okay. I think those buses are going to have a hell of a time turning around. So just think about the person driving the bus gotcha. and like, and then even on these sides, you know, and maybe there's a really specific reason which you know, someone would ask it more like a question. Mm -hmm. So there's like really specific individual lanes. Like the thing that comes to my mind is like in this lane, why couldn't you turn here or just go straight and join this one? You know, why why is this four completely separated lanes? It seems like there could just be a lot less paving and a lot less site circulation to get people into the building. So, but the building looks awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just to, I guess, comment on all of the circulation specifically over here. Um, that was a challenge for me, um, but the main idea is to not, to have separate lanes for each trash truck. Um, and then whether like that parking lot right there specifically was for overnight parking uh, for the trash trucks. So it we kind of created these like specific lanes for them uh, to go back and forth, but to not interrupt another trash truck that was coming. So I guess I was just thinking of the overall traffic flow when it came to like producing multiple lanes, but I also, I appreciate that comment. I think it's important because we were trying to figure out how many lanes or um, whether we needed that one or not. So it's good to know. Thank you. Uh, I'm kind of ignorant about all these issues myself. And then uh, first thing that I wondered was that uh, why couldn't the sorting facility be part of the uh, building? Mm. In my mind, sorting is very important part of the education that people coming here will not be the people who will work here, but people who will uh, actually generate them the trash and then they can sort themselves if they know how to do that to begin with. So I wonder that if sorting facility also needs to be part of the exhibit that you're showing people to the people that how you actually sort and then maybe uh, it becomes part of the experience that they can do that uh, they can actually try to sorting uh, trashes together. And um, by saying that uh, uh, your your product has a public part and functional part uh, together. Mm -hmm. And then I like the way that you created this spine that is connecting them together without uh, actually directly uh, physically connecting them together. At the same time, uh, there is a the, the, the functional part and the public part has a similar language different language and different style and different skill. And I, I think you may consider that the public part becomes more the face of the face of the project and functional part is a little bit more talked in further. So that becomes the whole uh, order issue and everything mm -hmm. can be a little bit further away. Mm -hmm. and then maybe you can tie that uh, sorting facility together and then push your, everything out a little bit further, and then you still have the create uh, connection. And then I think architecturally, it will, uh, in my mind, it will be important to show that uh, the functional part and the public part is really connected together to mm -hmm. the, in terms of language, not just by changing the uh, loop slope one direction or the other, but with the, that giant loop maybe sweeping down all the way to the public part, maybe that becomes the main entry close to the parking and such. But uh, overall, this was very educational to me. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Just <laughs> okay. Um. Thank you. It's it's interesting to see how this changed since we last met. Um. I think one of the things that I'm hearing from a lot of people is a real challenge for us. One is the unintended consequences of quote unquote doing good right? Yeah. Or thinking we're doing good when we might in fact not be, um, which is something we talked about, right? Like, mm -hmm. how do you guarantee that the Zabelines who were making money before are still in control of that and that you don't have politicians or other people now that there's wonderful facility 
and you still have the, you know, people being paid really poorly and kids doing that. So it's something that's sort of out of the architecture role, but it's at the same time something we have to be really knowledgeable. Um, and I wonder if, you know, in hindsight, this project would have benefited by having someone really who's more understood this kind of political sociological piece of it. Um, one of the one of the questions that came up, which I think is related to Matt's first question of how do you get people here, is the conversation of, okay, this isn't an area where there's no other building here, no other residents, right. and people who may not have a lot of money are not going to take a bus and they're going to start building homes right next to it, right? And in a city that's growing as fast as Cairo is, um, I think you have to expect that to happen. So rather than sort of leaving all that empty land, I would love to see your proposal for what it's like in 10 years after this opens or what it's like in 20 years after it opens. Mm -hmm. And so that the idea really potentially does include that community and that strategy of saying, we're putting it out far away from everybody else, isn't really a realistic strategy for Cairo because any place there's land, yeah. people are gonna move into. So right. knowing, that's most likely, right? I think that's a place where as architects, we can propose an idea for how that development could go. That's a really interesting point. Um, just because I've changed the site five times because of how quickly, no, 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 I know. But I'm saying like how quickly it changed. The previous site that I had chosen, um, there was all these new apartment complexes on them. So I, I understand the point of what you're saying. Um, and it's a really good one because Cairo is, constantly growing yeah a place with apartment buildings might require a very different strategy yes this is something different um it, it is a, a, a wonderful problem to put out there and you know i mean we're not going to be able to change the politics in cairo for the people who collect trash and stuff but you certainly can improve the environmental conditions you know right. and i think that's sort of what you're trying to do right. a couple of things i think are things to think about about this project which which for me, I'd like to see more of. Like, for example, I look at it, and aside from the palm trees, it could be almost anywhere. And I wonder, you know, there was a period of time before World War II, at least in America and probably other countries, when when public infrastructure had clearly a kind of regional character to it. You know, when I think about, you know, even the Macmillan sand filtration site in D.C. or the Del Carlia reservoir had a kind of mm -hmm. publicness and how the buildings looked and stuff and they look like they belonged in washington and i'm wondering if whether one of the challenges would be whether this could have some aspects of being in egypt um and still be the sort of modern architecture you want to do in mm -hmm. other words a patterning on the metal and things that might be a recognizable pattern to right. the culture would be one way to start to do that okay. you know and i think probably right now it doesn't quite do that for me the second thing for me would be the landscape. And I think the walk from the parking lot to the front door on a hot day in Egypt, and it gets pretty, pretty freaking hot there, right? Yes. <laughs> would not be terribly pleasant. Yeah. And I'd really want to kind of have some sort of clear garden experience, shaded experience. And I think you have those things, but they don't look like they shade very much. Um, I'd want that kind of experience of, you know, something that was more intense there. The third thing about the site planning is I wonder, you know, I know I know you're coming into this forecourt and then there's this exhibition hall. Uh, the, the relationship between the edge of the processing side and the edge of the um, kind of human side, the classrooms and all that, isn't very clear to me yet. Okay. And I'm wondering, and, and this is, if, if I was continuing to work on this with you, I would want you to look at maybe coming in along a line of fracture rather than coming in because when I get here I come in and the implication of that and that and getting to that is not very clear in the plan and I'd almost want to turn the thing so I moved that way between the service side and the sort of um, museum human clean classroom side so I saw the opposition between the two you know so that so that there was clear a sense that you know if this thing if this all went like that and the back of the house stuff was all there and this was the stuff facing the street there i would walk along and i'd have this sort of oppositional thing on either side and that might go some distance to sort of making the point about 
our world and the potential of our world. Right now, I find my way to that overview thing inside the building, I think. And I think it's not as impactful as a kind of, you know, something that where you really can look on one side and see the trash coming in and it being processed. And on the other side, explanations of, you know, things like Michael was talking about, about how these could be parks and landscapes and it really makes the connection between the two. You know? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Any final juror comments? Before I hand it to the chair. All right. So I'm on work. I'm the chair of uh, Samantha's thesis. So Samantha, I just want to, uh, first of all, congratulate you, Thank you. for a uh, very rich experience. It was, uh, it was hopefully as enriching um, as I think it was for me, <laughs> certainly. Yeah. It was a very challenging uh, project to, to supervise uh, because I think the, the comments that came up reflect the complexity of the, the project. So we spent about maybe, uh, well, a few months. You spent a few months trying to understand ways to energy facilities. Yes. And then we spent the, the, the other half trying to delve into these very complex issues. So trying to navigate that uh, in a limited time span uh, while you're also tackling other things like a hut competition and uh, health issues and whatnot. Uh, I, I find it very admirable. Um, so I, I want to uh, acknowledge some of the, the comments uh, as, as being uh, very valid. I, I feel like some uh, aspects, some, some of the niche aspects of the, of the project require certain development. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we're both aware of that. But I still feel like uh, you did a very good job and I'm happy with the result. And uh, I think this is what a thesis should be. It was, it's a learning path. It's, uh, it's trying to believe in the power of architecture to change uh, the world for good. And um, even though it, it delves into very complex political and social situations, uh, it also surfaces uh, reveals uh, the the complexity of of waste as a as a reality of our of our uh, existence and how uh, it, it's out of sight out of mind for for most of us. Uh, so in that sense, this opened my eyes to to that reality and and many other realities as well. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, with that, I'll reiterate. Congratulations to all of our first day thesis presenters. We have two more days to go tomorrow and the next day. Thank you so much to our jury, TJ, Devin, Candice, Mika, Dana, and Bill. Thank you guys so much for spending the day with us. Um, come back tomorrow if you like. We'll be here at 9 a.m. Um, in this space. And do you have comments? Oh, and Brian is, will be back with us tomorrow too, virtually. <laughs> all the way. All right. Well, thank you very much for being here and see you tomorrow.